and now I don't see me. There I am. That wasn't three minutes. What the heck's going on here? Uh, how's everybody doing? Welcome to this week's Hang Up. I'm Matt Delaney. Uh, I have a guest already right here and ready to go and to talk about stuff, but I've got bits of news that I need to get to um, before we can get started. And that is, uh, f- full disclosure, I am a board member of the American Atheist uh, Organization, and so I'm not doing this uh, to promote that organization in, in any way. Uh, they're just awesome, and so it makes sense to try uh, to to tell people a little bit what's going on. In addition to most of the other uh, efforts that American Atheist participates in, one of the things they do is lawsuits uh, to address injustices and to make sure that the rights of atheists are protected and to work towards atheist normalcy and other things like that. Um, I'm going to read uh, chunks of an article, so a huge hat tip, first of all, uh, Hat tip to American Atheists and Jeff Blackwell, who's been a guest on this show, um, who's litigation counsel for American Atheists. Uh, I have some quotes from him, but the the story was uh, written up by Hemet Mehta uh, over at Friendly Atheists. If you're not already a reader of Friendly Atheists, I I don't know what you've been up to, because uh, let's be honest, for years and years, um, look at something like uh, the nonprofits which when, when I was with the ACA, we would do nonprofits. It was often be from my apartment, Jeff D, Russell Glasser, Dennis Lubay. And for a long time, it was just me and Dennis. And we would grab news items from around the net. And most of those, most of those came from Hemet, Hemet's uh, Friendly Atheist blog and other stuff. So if you're not already checking out uh, Hemet's content, you've missed out. But I'm not going to read the entire article. In the short version, is that a, an inmate in West Virginia named Andrew T. Miller um, was assigned to the West Virginia Division of Corrections Rehabilitation and had been uh, basically told that he needed to participate in a uh, particular program, uh, that being the Residential Substance Abuse Treatment Program. And he discovered that that program was expressly Christian, like a lot of other substance uh, abuse and substance treatment programs, the 12 strike, various 12 step programs, things like that, um, they get closer and closer to Christian. But this one was very clearly expressly uh, Christian. And inmates are placed in that program and they're required to complete it if they want to be granted parole. Um, Not, it's a six to 12 month program. And if you don't go through it, there's a penalty that lists you as more of a security threat. Well, the program includes the Lord's Prayer, the Serenity Prayer, the 12 steps that refer to a higher power. Uh, Other parts in the handbook tells participants, quote, for our group purposes, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. And in addition to the item of the books, there's uh, required homework about talking about what God means to you and what prayer means to you. And so he was told he needed to go through that in, uh, he realized how religious it was and he requested an alternative option. He was willing to do everything in the course that didn't involve professing a religious faith that he didn't participate in. Well, his request was denied and so were his multiple, uh, grievance complaints that challenged that denial. The people in charge said he had no choice but to go through the Christian program. As a result of his pushback, he was denied parole three separate times, with the board specifically citing the non-completion of the RSAT program as a significant reason he wasn't allowed to go free. So you've got someone who's essentially been told, you're going to complete this program, and if you don't, we're going to list you as a security risk. And if you don't, every time you come up for parole, we're going to keep pointing out, he hasn't done the the RSAT program, the RSAT program. He hasn't done it. He hasn't done it. Well, um, that's blatantly unconstitutional. And um, so Jeff Blackwell from the Litigation Council for American Atheists wrote, West Virginia, like too many states, is forcing Christianity on the people incarcerated in their facilities as a condition of release. Attacks like this one on the rights of atheists, humanists, and any non-Christian person who interacts with the West Virginia Division of Corrections are ongoing and widespread. For many corrections officials, spreading religious propaganda is more important than respecting people's rights or the Constitution. No one should be compelled to sacrifice their moral or religious creed to obtain release from incarceration in West Virginia. Mountain State Justice is proud to work with American Atheists to stand up for Mr. Miller's rights to follow his conscience and security humanists. Uh, that was the, the last quote, sorry, was from Leslie Nash. 
uh, when when this got put together, I missed that we switched from talking about uh, Jeff's quote to to uh, Leslie Nash, who's part of Mountain State Justice. Um, the U.S. District Judge Joseph Goodwin yesterday uh, issued a preliminary injunction telling the West Virginia Department of Corrections to remove the RSAT program from this individual's reentry program plan. So basically, if you're in prison and you're, you're you're being processed to potentially get parole, they have a plan. Here's the things you need to accomplish in order to uh, be considered likely for parole. And the judge also uh, said to see to it that participation in that program, uh, quote, is not considered as a factor in his eligibility for parole. Um, and this ruling really not only benefits Miller, but other atheists uh, incarcerated as well. Um, the Judge Goodwin explained that plenty of other states with similar programs have had lawsuits and the courts have unanimously agreed that religious content of those programs violated the Constitution. This program was no less religious or coercive than the ones that had already been struck down. This preliminary injunction means that if this case were to proceed through the courts, Miller would probably win the case. I'm now reading Hemet's words. And if action isn't taken immediately, he would be, quote, likely to suffer irreparable harm. Throughout the ruling, there are blunt statements by the judge slamming the prison for forcing Miller to go through their religious program. Um, now, number one is the factual allegations contained in the complaint, if true, show that the state of West Virginia has coerced the plaintiff into religious exercise. In sum, the evidence before the court wholly supports Mr. Miller's allegation that the defendants have substantially burdened his protected religious exercise. Having found that the state's objective does not justify the challenge program, I conclude the plaintiff is likely to succeed on the merits of his, basically, parole claim. And because Mr. Miller has shown an unreasonable encroachment on his First Amendment rights, I find him likely to succeed on the merits of his free exercise claim. Because Mr. Miller has shown a clear likelihood of constitutional violation, he has shown irreparable harm. This, this ruling from the judge, this preliminary injunction, um, the state could appeal, but they're not likely to win. What the judge is saying in, in plain speak is that this particular incarcerated individual likely would have been paroled if he would have agreed to participate in this expressly Christian program. And that his failure to participate in this program was the biggest reason that he had not been paroled. And so by continuing to refuse to parole him because he hadn't been, you know, lied and participated in uh, an expressly Christian thing, the state had violated his First Amendment rights and that programs like this had been shut down elsewhere and needed to be shut down here as well and could not and should, should not and could not be considered as uh, criteria for determining whether or not someone should be paroled. Uh, basically, what's happening in the state is they're attempting to force a profession of Christianity, at least, or participation in a de facto Christianity um, as a condition for parole. Now, it's bizarre to me for a number of reasons. I, it's, it's not that bizarre. I mean, I, I, I don't, nothing in here is particularly surprising given the world that we live in. But what, what is bizarre to me is that there seems to be this perception that people in prison need Jesus. And yet overwhelmingly, the people in prison uh, already think they have Jesus. Um, when you look at prison statistics, it's very hard to tell what percentage of them are, are non-Christians. And there's a reason for that, which we're seeing part of in this case. Many of them become or profess Christianity, whether they are a Christian or not, uh, in order to sway parole boards or to get favored treatment. Others were definitely believers when they went in because it's not, it's not like only atheists are the ones that commit crimes. As a matter of fact, the statistics we have may show that atheists are less likely to be uh, incarcerated. But we can't really say that. Be very careful. I've seen this years over, for years and years. People are like, oh, there's way fewer atheists represented in, in prison than there are in the, you know, in, the, in the population at large. Except that you, you can't really do that because you don't have access to somebody's mind. And when there's a, a benefit um, to pretending to believe something or claiming you believe something, you know, if I go to prison, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I, sorry. Uh, I'm probably not. But I mean, I, I'm, I'm pointing out that many people are going to do that. But 
there are many people who were Christians before they went in, and it's not that they need Jesus. It's that people think, ah, they've fallen away from their religious upbringing. Uh, they've fallen away from the things that would have made them moral. And yet we have murderers, thieves, rapists, all of whom, um, in, in many cases, these individuals grew up as sincere believers. And for one of many reasons, they wound up incarcerated. And of course, those people are going to immediately recognize their indoctrinated religious uh, beliefs are going to be a benefit to them getting out on parole. And it is a violation of the First Amendment and basic human dignity for the courts to hold adherence to some sort of Christian um, program as a condition of parole. What it does is it doesn't make anybody a better person. There's no demonstration of efficacy or that participating in, in this program, becoming a Christian or identifying as a Christian in any way means that there's a lowered chance of recidivism. Um, we already have uh, numbers on, on how likely recidivism is merely because you've been incarcerated, because incarceration is not rehabilitative. Recidivism rates are incredibly high. And it's immoral to force people to, to adopt a particular religious view in order to get out of prison. And they're, most of them are going to do it. I don't know this individual, um, this Mr. Miller. Um, I hope he gets paroled soon if he's met all of his other requirements. And uh, while well, I have no idea if merely his being an atheist would make the two of us uh, friends or friendly or whatever else, I can say I am happy to admire someone who was unwilling to lie and to participate in a religious indoctrination just to have an easier time getting out of prison. That, that for, for me, on a parole board, that's integrity. Not someone who comes in and says, oh, yes, I, I did terrible things and I shouldn't have done it, but now I've seen the light and I've participated in the RSAT program and Jesus has helped me and I feel like I'm ready to go back out and reenter the public and to, to never come back here again and to do what I can to make sure I'm inspiring young kids. You can say all the right things, but here you have an individual who whatever his other character flaws may be, flatly refuse to compromise and pretend to be something he wasn't and pretend to support a program that he couldn't just to get a, a reduced sentence or to be paroled. And I have no idea what his other crimes are. I have no idea the quality of his character beyond that. Um, but I can definitely respect that. He may turn out to be just an absolutely terrible person that I want nothing to do with. That's true of many atheists that I've actually met. So it doesn't, it wouldn't surprise me if, if that was true of uh, an atheist I'd never met. But this action on his part is laudable and, and admirable. Uh, now, normally I try to bring in an expert, uh, but this was some last minute news and I already had my guest today. And so, Let's not pretend that Jim Barrows is a former uh, felon or a member of the prison system. Anything <laughs> <laughs> about I just that he who hasn't been on the show in a while, who got bumped so that we could have a lawyer come on and talk. So please welcome tonight's guest, Jim Barrows. Hey, How how's you it going? No, no. As far as I know, I've never been in prison. <laughs> if you had, I didn't hear about it. So I'm wondering, though. Exactly. I, I didn't either. Do you, I, it's hard to say what you would actually do in the situation, but if you were incarcerated and they tried to force you to do the RSAT program, do you think that you would just go along with it, uh, you know, as going through the motions in order to appease the parole board? Or do you think you'd have, I don't know whether or not I would have, I'm, I'm, I'm a fucking out atheist and as, yeah. and as out as you're going to find. And I don't know if I would have done what this guy did. Yeah, I, I think that because I am an out atheist, I would be somewhat obligated to do that, um, to to contact uh, the appropriate folks and, and get some help in uh, suing the prison system for getting rid of that. Um, yeah. But yeah, there is something to be said for just, you know, do whatever you have to to get out. But there's, yeah. 
I'd love to I, say that. Is the, what, I, I'm yeah, just saying I'd love to say that I do exactly what he did, but I don't know. Yeah, because what I'd be afraid of is somebody getting a hold of that recording and say, no, see, he actually did convert. Uh, he's only an atheist to make money or whatever. And so that would be kind of my big concern is someone saying I really did convert, et cetera, or reconvert, you know. So, and I just don't yeah. want to have that come up. Just easier. That to me is easier. It would be easier to do the, go to the lawsuit than it would be to put up with that nonsense. Yeah, I, I don't. The, the only reason I say I don't know because let's face it, um, the odds are good that if that if I ever have a conversion, uh, it's going to be something that everybody's going to recognize as a sincere change. Uh, I, right. I I wish that I could say that I would do that, but I don't know because I haven't been in prison and I don't know what his daily life is. And I don't know, you know, what are you willing to do to put an end to that? And and maybe that it, it almost wouldn't matter what I'd be willing to do that as somebody who's been a public outspoken atheist for so long, um, I, I just, even if I wanted to, I couldn't merely do that for parole. But. Right, yeah. That that presents its own difficulties doing what we do. So, <laughs> and yet doing what yeah, we do is the, hot buttered. Awesome. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. I'm just kind of hoping that, um, the prison system doesn't appeal and take it to the Supreme court. Cause I think, um, that the prison system will win, um, at the Supreme court, which is very sad to say, but I just don't see the current Supreme court, uh, supporting that decision. So it, it's they, very they difficult to let it rest. Uh, it's very difficult to tell what, what the su Supreme court might do. Um, American atheists, the, the statement that they released, um, it said, uh, Nick, Nick fish said, it's clear that religious coercion is an all too common issue in our nation's criminal justice system. This is a step in the right direction, but it's long overdue that we push for big systemic changes to finally fix this. We shouldn't have to file lawsuit after lawsuit to force the government to do the right thing, protecting the religious freedom of everyone, atheists included. And that's one of those things that I, I don't know people truly grasp both, uh, American Atheists, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, Americans United for Church State Separation, all of these organizations. Um, first of all, Americans United is not even an atheist organization. And the former uh, head of Americans United, the Reverend Barry Lynn and I, uh, talked about this uh, on, on several occasions before he retired. Um, and I loved the fact that there was a religious person who was, you know, would, would work alongside me for Church State mm -hmm. Separation. When we work for proper religious freedom it's not just to benefit atheists it benefits everybody the religious freedom that allows right. gemini to be gemini it's been so long since i got to say gemini the religious freedom <laughs> that allows jim and myself uh, to to be atheists and to be vocal about it is the same religious freedom that lets you be a catholic a protestant a hindu a muslim a scientologist or make up your own religion because that's how the rest of them got started anyway um and you'll get to do that. And, and that the limits on that come where you don't get to impose your religion on other people. Yeah, I have, uh, uh, it boggles my mind that, that Christians don't see that, uh, that it benefits them as well, right? Because Christians out there who, who don't want to see Westboro Baptist Church type Christianity in play. Um, yeah. So, you know, to be the, the, the law of the land. Um, and you could end up with that if you're not careful or the Quakers or, you know, pick a fringe group that doesn't have, that has beliefs you don't want. How do you not see the freedom from religion benefits you, you know, in that regard, but now with people who don't. So, yeah, I've talked about a, a number of examples over the years of people beginning to realize the, the true benefits of proper, church state separation and proper freedom of religion that freedom of religion does require freedom from religion for the individuals um that uh church state separation is what benefits all of us and you know we're we've got callers waiting and i'm going to get to callers very soon including a couple theistic okay. callers so if, you're, if you're on the line uh hang on we'll get to you really quickly i appreciate everybody waiting we've you and i've been arguing this stuff um on various shows for many many years and I know people can walk away with the wrong impression that uh, 
Um, the only thing we care about is I'm right. You're wrong. Your, your God believes stupid. Uh, we're going to argue. And, and really, if, if there was a way where religious believers would stop voting and attempting to legislate their religious beliefs in such a way that it, it uh, marginalizes other people and prevents them from having um, equal standing, both under the law and in general practice in there, I don't think we'd be spending as much time on religion. I'd, I'd still care. And I'd still want to talk about skepticism, and critical thinking, and I'd want people to, uh, you know, to have good reasons for their beliefs. And if I'm wrong, I would want somebody to show me. But it's really about this encroachment on uh, where people's individual religious beliefs impact the rights of others. Yeah. And if you're going to claim objective moral values or that you have the objective moral truth, then uh, you should be able to point to the criteria. You should be able to point to the actual harm. You know, the, the things that exist outside of a human mind, because that's what objective means, and yet no one can do that. So let's do things that promote human happiness and, uh, you know, human flourishing, and we're not worry about the rest later, right? If you don't want to do something, then you don't do it. Don't legislate it for everybody else. But anyway. Well as you all know, uh, this is the Wednesday, Wednesday show. This is my Wednesday show, also known as The Hangup. It's one of many shows that are here on the Line Network. The Line Network, I'm proud to say, has crossed over 90,000 subscribers. And you can find information about the network down below in the video description. Uh, you can also find a link to the Patreon. We have a number of Patreon goals set up that are going to allow us to do LineCon next year in conjunction with a uh, total solar eclipse um, and there's a number of other things, including getting me, me and Jimmy to watch, um, oh, really bad Christian movies. Um, but let me tell you what's going on. on that, I, I, I want to help you guys watch those movies. <laughs> well, uh, if you want to get in on it, whoops. I just I just moved a window to some, to the wrong place. If you want to get into it, you can go to patreon.com slash call the line where these sorts of goals are listed. Uh, you can become a Patreon member there to support this organization. Uh, and you can support, I don't know, all of the line shows. You can support me. You can support Transatlantic call -in Show. You can support Skep Talk. Uh, you can be a super supporter. You can be a closing credits producer. There's all kinds of options in there for your monthly contributions. But Jimmy has set specific goals. Currently, we're like at 544 members, and I think at 750 is the next uh, next goal. I don't even have my notes from the last time. Jimmy's gonna. Jimmy should fucking fire me. Um, but I, I'm hoping he doesn't. Uh, but tomorrow on the Transatlantic Colin Show, Arden Hart and Kara Griffin from Recovering from Religion will be on. That's 2 p.m. Central Time. It's right now 6:23. So whatever time you tuned in to to watch this. Tune in four hours earlier tomorrow, right here at the same spot, and you'll be able to watch uh, the lovely and talented Arden Hart, who's also down the hall producing this particular show as well, um, and is just a wonderful person and a very successful snake breeder, as our first clutch has not only escaped their egg in the last week, but shed in the last 24 hours, and we did a live stream identifying uh, all four of those babies, uh, what their morphs were, and we're pretty sure that we got all girls, which is, uh, which is a, a big deal. In addition to Transatlantic call -in Show, uh, this Sunday will be uh, me and Jimmy at 2 p.m. for the Sunday show. Monday's Skep Talk will be John Gleason with a special guest. Tuesday's Dying Out Loud with Dave Warnock. He'll be joined by Andrew Seidel. That's all coming up before I come back next Wednesday with another edition of The Hang Up. And we're not sure who my guest is going to be um, or if there's going to be a guest because. You never know. Sometimes I might just fly solo. I might just next week's hang up might be a it's been too long since I sat here and just talked all by myself. Um, and then we'll see if anybody even tunes in for something like that. I'm sure they will. What do you think, Jim? You ready to take some calls? Let's do it. As a reminder, we don't only take religious calls here, but any show that I'm on, which is you know a part of the regular production. Uh, theistic callers are always going to get uh, priority. 
And so we have a theist on the line right now, Jeffrey, in California. Pronouns are he, him. Um, I can I can hear your dog, Jeffrey. But welcome to the Hang Up with Matt and Jim. Sorry about that. I have a question for you both. Sure. Um, do you believe that the universe had a beginning? Well, it depends on That's how you define. The best evidence. Uh, it depends on how you define a beginning. Um, for example, the local presentation well, of our universe. Uh, wow. Right. Yes. So you would so you would say that the universe had a beginning. So the, our local presentation of a universe began at some point, but that doesn't mean that the material didn't pre-exist. Correct. Okay. So. Do you think that maybe it makes more sense that instead of everything just being more on the random side, that there could possibly be a creator? No. You don't no. think so? See, the problem that you, you that you have with that question is that you're assuming that, that the supernatural exists. That simply is not the case. Over the last 2,000 years, there has been no phenomenon to, that has been shown that was once thought to be supernatural has shown to actually have a supernatural explanation. Natural explanations have won by far, and I will be generous and say there are only phenomena that I'm aware of um, that uh, we can say unknown to, and those are uh, uh, near-death experiences, NDEs, and I'll even give you uh, uh, the uh, burial cloth, the shroud, as well as an unknown. I'll give you those two. So out of every okay. single phenomena we know of, we have natural explanations for, and we have two maybes that may be supernatural, and the supernatural has never been explained. So at this point, how do you come to the conclusion for a supernatural explanation for anything, given its losing track record? Well, just the bad fact how um, I feel as though the world is very complex, and it seems to be that everything in our universe kind of works out as in like if you go into physics and all that kind of stuff it seems like it kind of complements each other in a way that seems like it would take a little bit more um than randomness to create so um well again it, so how did you determine that how do i determine that wait i'm sorry can you repeat that again yeah that's exactly what the question was how did you i can't that? sorry how do I determine? Well, uh, well, do you know the prophet like Lima? The what? What? The prophet um, Ligma? The prophet what? Are you I, I muted him. He just said the prophet Ligma, which is the segue to Ligma balls. So you have a troll on the line. You can drop his ass. Oh. Okay. Uh. Beat you to it, Jeffrey. Yeah. God, Jeffrey, that's so disappointing because, you know, Jim was not only making good points, but I had slightly different takes on this. When you talk about the question that he asked was, does it make more sense that there could possibly be a creator? And I just said no, but I was waiting to see what he said because I have no idea if an intentional creative agent is possible or not. And I have no idea how probable that agent is if it were possible. And I have no idea, and if I don't know how probable it is, then I can't reasonably say that it's more probable than not. And so the simple question, the simple answer to his question of, you know, don't you think it's more probable that there's a creator uh, is no, I don't think that, but it might be, I don't know. I, how, how do we tell? And that's kind of what Jim was getting at it, is right. when, when Jeffrey says, well, it just seems that everything in the universe works out and it's so complex. But that's going to be true for any universe we inhabit. A, a created universe that, that includes human beings um, and an uncreated universe that includes human beings have the exact same features, the same complexity, the same everything works out. And so Jim's question was absolutely perfect. How do you look at that and conclude that the best explanation um, is that there's a, a God? I, I, you know, it's... I'm sorry, Jeffrey. It's incredibly disappointing to find out that you were. What what kind of person just tries to get someone to know. say ligma balls? Do you know how many times I've said ligma balls? Not never. Well, not ligma, uh, but lick my balls. Um, 
you know, I, I'd rather, Jeffrey, if you called in next time and said, hey, Matt, hey, Jim, would you guys say lick my balls or let me say lick my balls? And then we could address it honestly. But how disappointing that the best you could come up with was that. Yeah. And here we are treating him with respect, giving his questions and what he is doing, you know. And, and putting him on as a first caller. Yeah. I'm very disappointed. It's, it's all right. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed it, Jeffrey. Have a good day. Chris in yeah. is it Idaho or Indiana, Prince or he him? It's, it's Idaho. Idaho. Wow. Uh, I had friends who were from Idaho, but I, I've only driven through there just briefly. So welcome. Uh, you're on with Jim and Matt. How can we help? Okay. Um, so I, okay. Just kind of looking at this from like a, just being neutral. Um, there's a lot of research coming out. Um, and Joe Rogan, you know, speaks on this quite a bit. Um, DMT. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I had a question for you though. Um, the last time you called yeah. in, you said your name was Rick from Nevada, and now you're saying your name's Chris from Idaho. That's my dad. Ah, your dad. <laughs> Sweet. I just, you know, yeah, we've already had called, one troll today, and I was like, if we're gonna have a second troll, I'd rather you just cut to the chase and get the troll thing done. And if not, cool, we can have a conversation. What's up? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, he calls in quite a bit. Uh, yeah, but my question, well, it's more just like what your guys thoughts on this specific thing. There's a lot of research coming out on that, uh, DMT, uh, which is also produced by our body. Um, I think it's like in the pineal gr uh, gland in the brain, um, mm -hmm. some parts of the, uh, you know, lungs and heart is what they're thinking. And when somebody gets like, an overabundance of this, you know, DMT, it, it kind of catapults them into this uh, experience where they kind of come back and they're like, after having that experience, like, I, I, I believe that there's something bigger than me. And, you know, that's like nine times out of 10, the person's coming back from that experience saying it's, it was something profound. And, you know, there's, uh, there's been discussion, you know, they've been deemed the spirit molecule, spirit molecule. And, um, basically they're just, you know, it, it could possibly be a hijacking of, you know, obviously the, the nervous system, just making somebody experience these things. But, you know, nine times out of 10, they're coming back from the experience saying that there's something bigger than, so, sure. um, I just kind of wanted your, your thoughts on, on that. <laughs> go for it jim uh yeah dmt uh interesting chemical um and personal experience especially on drugs like dmt is probably not the best thing to base anything off of um other than hey this might be something fun to try someday uh you know and until they can actually prove some you know that the, the there is some shift in the consciousness um out of mm -hmm. this world or into the, whatever they're claiming uh, that exists outside of their own, uh, you're, we're stuck with again, right over the last 2,000 years, uh, supernatural phenomena batting zero, natural phenomena batting almost a thousand. Um, how, how supernatural or non natural explanation just based on those odds? Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't see how you can. The odds are against us, um, you know, well, even giving two phenomena. But so that's what I, I'm kind of at is, yeah, cool chemical. Uh, there's also some very scary ones out there, but th that's a cool one. I'm just, I'm just wondering, first of all, there okay. were some, there were some breakups in, in Jim's audio, but Chris, I was wondering, let's say we found yep. a drug and, and we gave it to a thousand people and all 1000 people after taking the drug said, I had this amazing experience where I felt one with the universe and it felt like there was some mind there communicating with me. What does that tell us about right. whether or not there's a mind out there communicating with people? Well, 
I, I think one possibility is that um, whatever Curved. you're you're taking Chris? in, it, it, yes, it, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Because I asked a specific question. Yeah, am I breaking up? No, no. I asked a specific question. You're not answering it. If there were a thousand people okay. and we gave them some drug, and every single person who took that drug had the same experience of feeling one with the universe and that there was some external mind that they felt like they touched. What does that tell us about whether or not there's a mind that they actually touched? To be honest with you, I mean, I, I think it's interesting that that many people are reporting the same, um, the same experience. Um, I mean, I guess it could go the other way to where it's like that drug is, that's just what it produces. And um, so I guess you're kind of in the middle there. You can kind of go either way. Well, so I, 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 I'll, I'll go ahead and be as charitably listening as I can. What, the answer to my question is that doesn't tell us anything about whether or not there's actually a mind out there to touch, because it could be that this is a drug that allows you to access a real connection to a mind, or it could be a drug that produces a ph phenomenon that people describe as touching a mind, whether that mind exists or not. And so when we're right. looking at DMT or psilocybin mushrooms or, uh, you know, C11, H17NO3, whatever chemical we're actually going to use, mescaline, um, these psychedelics we know alter the brain. And the question then becomes, is the information that we get from that altered brain more reliable and accurate or less reliable and accurate than a properly functioning or a normatively functioning brain. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to stamp like, oh, this is concrete evidence that there is a mind, obviously, but um, I, I find it interesting, though, that our body produces that chemical, and there has been research where they're actually saying that that could actually be regulating how we perceive reality. The, yeah. the, the, the very Let's uh, imagine, you know, though, minimal amount of DMT. Go ahead. Let's imagine, though, that what DMT and, and perhaps other similar psychoactive substances, what they do is they trick the mind into thinking there's a connection with some other external mind that doesn't exist. If that's what happens, yeah. and DMT is something that's produced um, naturally as well in limited doses, then maybe religious experiences where people feel without taking any drugs, where people feel that they've connected with the mind, are just their body producing uh, that substance or some similar substance in a way that tricks them. The thing that we have to do is figure out, okay, is this a real More connection? Likely. Kind of like yeah. if, if somebody puts their hand on a Ouija board planchette and it moves around and they could be convinced that they're communicating with a spirit. But how do we show whether or not they are communicating with a spirit? Well, it turns out there's ways to test it and we have, and Ouija boards are bullshit. Um, there's the, yeah. you, know, you, you can, you can take, for example, Penn and Teller did it where they uh, blindfolded everybody. And as long as the Ouija board was in the same orientation as before, they could get yes, no's and things like that, even blindfolded. But as soon as you turn the Ouija board upside down, um, they do exactly the same thing as if it was right side up. Well, are the spirits blindfolded too, or is this a matter of the idiomotor reflex and people are moving it around? It doesn't mean they're lying. Just like when we, like I've had experiences um, that were amazing on drugs and on not on drugs. Uh, the difference is that I don't presume that my chemically altered mind is tapping into something more true and more real. I, I would need supportive evidence for right. that. And I'm not aware of any supportive evidence that any uh, psychedelic is making your brain function more accurately. And so as they keep coming up with uh, more studies, all of these studies are just showing how people describe their experiences, which is completely separate from what those experiences actually are. And I find it interesting too, just not so much that I'm going to spend, well, 
I'll probably spend some time high, but I don't need to spend a great deal of time high right. until there's a good reason to think it's going to let me tap right. into something other than, you know, fun. I've had lots of fun, but, but I don't think I, I, I remember I told a story um, when Jordan Peterson and I did our event in, um, was it Toronto? Anyway, wherever, wherever the hell it was. Uh, I talked about this one yeah, time I think so. where, where I was on acid and I saw a super strawberry in the, in the door and it flew off the door did a lap around my head and slammed right into it. Uh, it was one of the most real things I've ever seen while on a drug, but I don't think that there's a super strawberry realm and I don't think they have a message for humanity. And that's the thing that scares me is that a lot of people might take these substances um, or naturally produce these substances, uh, which I think is, is the, the scarier option. If, if your body is chemically altering itself to give you experiences and you're like, hey, I didn't take any drugs. I, I wasn't, this was, no, no, I saw the weirdest stuff and I wasn't on any drugs at all. Well, first of all, you don't know if you were dosed, but hey, you see what I'm saying? That people could have those experiences and reach completely the wrong conclusion about what's real. Well, but your um, acid is more of a synthetic. I, I would be, in, I'd be interested to know whether or not acid, the synthetic chemical, produces because you said a strawberry you know uh man running around compared to maybe somebody that does the mushrooms or has it, more of like a a different experience than somebody that takes you understand like the synthetic well, no synthetic it's, it's, it's that form of it to me. it's amusing to me that i gave an example of one drug that i'd taken all of these fit into the same category of drugs and you went to acid synthetic what difference does it make whether or not something's synthetic? Is something synthetic less likely to give you an accurate uh, uh I would experience? think so. Why? What, I, what, is your justification? So. what is your justification? Because that sounds like the naturalistic fallacy to me, where this okay. pseudoscientific bullshit about, oh, no, 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 it's synthetic versus natural. No, no, it either it alters your brain in a certain way or it doesn't. Why would it make a difference? Mm. Okay. If it alters your brain for a particular experience, why would its synthetic um, uh, uh, nature make it produce less reliable experiences? I, uh, I could, I guess, I could see your point there. Um, I mean, it's a chemical is a chemical, and um, yeah. you know, different. Um, you know, yeah. So, yeah, I understand what you're saying there, but. Um, do you think it's possible that maybe the uh, substances are eroding kind of the, because we see everything, you know, obviously the natural world and everything, it could be a something that erodes that and, and opens us up to more of a spiritual experience. Do you think that's possible? How would that even work? At least entertain that? How would that, that even work? What was that? How would that I work? Said, how would that even work? Yeah. I mean, you're assuming, um, you're assuming that there's yeah. something beyond the natural world that we could erode our perception of the natural world so that we could see the thing beyond the natural world. But you haven't even demonstrated that there's mm -hmm. anything beyond the natural world. Well, you know, you, you mentioned the strawberry person, you know, coming running around in the room. And that kind of okay. threw you off, but I, I would say maybe the majority of the experiences, um, I, I was doing some research where there's like, there's more uh, like negative energies and stuff like that, that come through, um, that people that's experience. That's a meaningless and, phrase. So that's meaningless? my point was, yes, it's meaningless. My point was, we okay. we have no reason to, we have no reason to think there's anything beyond the natural world. So you're 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 asking, is it possible that we're eroding the natural world with these so that we can see some other world? Well, how can you tell if something is possible if the thing you're talking about has never demonstrated to be possible? Maybe there is nothing but the natural world. But to say negative energies, what the hell does that mean? Yeah, okay. when you say negative energy, I'm thinking negative pull on a battery. Right. Um, I'm thinking it, it, yeah. of gravity and anti gravity of some kind. So when you say negative energy, you need to immediately define what you mean by energy because 
You don't mean okay. anything natural. Well, and see previous data I'll, I'll give, supernatural. So, right. So I'll give you a, a instance of of a situation because I've experimented cool. with it, and cool. Um, not not like acid or anything strong like that, but you know, like cannabis. And I've stepped away from the experience. Um, initially, I, I felt like a negative uh, experience. I don't know what some that type means. Of a negative, uh, some type of negative energy coming through. I don't know like, what that means. That's, you can't define a term by using the term. It doesn't evil. Work. So you need to define negative okay. I don't know okay. what that means either. What, what, what does it mean? Um, so evil, in my, my understanding, evil isn't something that exists as a thing. Evil is a, label we, evil is a label that we put on something when it conflicts with particular goals. Um, what I, what I would say is evil being like the purest form, like adulterated. That, that um, doesn't make any sense to me. And, and I, yeah, I, I know because no I sense. can't really explain it because it's more of a perception. It's, um, that I'm experiencing when I'm in that state. I yeah. can't really explain it. how okay. it's how you, you find a way to describe it. But that means that not only was your experience subjective, your description of it was subjective, and you don't have any way of explaining this in a way that's edifying. You, you might as well be saying, right. you know, when you, when you say, oh, I experienced something that was evil. Well, let me tell you, I've, I've never really had uh, what, what people would call a bad trip or a trip where you have experiences that you don't enjoy. Um, and I've, mm -hmm. I've, I tripped one time while watching The Omen. And there's a moment in the omen where a sheet of glass slides off the back of a truck and decapitates someone and the head sort of kind of spins on there. And let me tell you, when your brain turns that into a slow motion experience and you are sitting on the carpet and you backpedal like this to get as far away from the TV as possible, I could see someone describing that as a negative experience. but. From my perspective, right. I just saw something that was intended to shock me, that was intended to be terrifying, and it did what it was supposed to, but I didn't sense or feel evil. I don't even know what it means to feel evil. I, I know that people use that phrase. Oh, that was, you know, evil. Well, well it's evil to describe what people do when they harm other people. I, I don't understand what it means for something to be an evil incarnate or an evil force or an evil presence okay. that's immaterial because none of those things are real to me. Okay. Well, what I, what I was trying to say is I, I felt that presence and, and I, I know that you're like, well, you're not giving me clear cut, you know, experience Keep about w what it is, but I'm just saying I felt it. I stepped away. From, from that drug for a period of time, completely forgot about the experience, did it again, and felt the same uh, presence. Okay. Is it and possible that I, you forgot again, I know how it, did you feel it again? Exactly. That's, that's my whole point. It's like, it, like, how would I, if I forgot about it, and that was kind of like my test, you know what I mean? And I guess it could so wait, be something wait, uh, subconsciously. Wait. wait. You, you you decided to create a test where because you had a an experience of a particular type on a drug, you decided to take the same drug uh -huh. again to see if you had the same experience and you did and you were surprised. I yes, I was. Why, I was like because why, I completely why, forgot why, about the why you completely forgot about it i've been drunk several times i've been high on weed several times i've been high on acid several mm -hmm. times i've never been surprised to have the same sort of experience on those drugs i think it's asinine to take the same drug more than once and expect a dramatically different experience well and, yeah. and i'm kind of confused by your statement you forgot about it and then you had the same experience how do you know you had the same experience if you forgot about it that makes no sense that's that's kind of my entire point is if for me it's like maybe there is experience you know no sense reg regarding drugs that, that's your whole point you had you had an you had a weird right. experience 
it, fun it, drug. It is. It is. It is. Kind of yeah, I mean, stuff, you know, right? and that it is. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I'm not calling in saying, "Hey, this is," you know, like I believe it, and like, but I'm just saying, like, exploring drugs, the, the possibility. You, you should stop <laughs> Probably, taking drugs. Yeah. yeah, because you don't seem to have good experiences, and you seem surprised that you continue to have bad experiences, and you seem prone to thinking that maybe there's something meaningful in those experiences, and none of those things, and that's not supported by the evidence, so maybe you should just stop taking drugs. Right. That, <laughs> Probably, that's, that's as, yeah. As, as, as I thought about thought, it. But, but we got to move on. Uh, please take care of yourself. You and... Uh, <laughs> Yep. Don't be surprised when doing the same thing results in the same outcome, but take care. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, take care. All right. Bye. And in fact, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. <laughs> now, I know people, um, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I mean, I don't want to turn this into the drug show, um, but I, I know people who have had, for example, on psychedelics, what they would call good trips and bad trips. And so mm -hmm. what we know about some of that, especially those of us who've done it several times, is that your mindset going into that experience is probably, in my opinion, the biggest factor in determining the quality and nature of that experience. If you are, if you feel safe, if you are, um, looking forward to it, if you are perhaps with other people, um, I, there were five or six people who all, all experienced psychedelics at the same time. And one of the things that, that some of the groups that I had, had been with at different times were very good about is making sure that there was essentially a babysitter, that if you're going to take something that's going to alter your mind, there's going to be something there to watch and to make sure that, uh, here's your touchstone for reality in case something bad happens. But yeah. Yeah. Drugs doing drug things. Can't imagine. And I, I'm not anti drug. I'm not pro drug. Um I think yeah. I think we weed should be legal everywhere. And by the way, it essentially is legal everywhere in the United States because I, I hate to tell all my anti drug friends, but the Delta eight or the, the Delta eight, Delta nine THC zero, all of those um slightly altered it's weed. It, it, it is it is just weed and it's not going to be long before weed's legal and that's fine, but it's not for everybody. I have, I have people who I'm close to whose, whose body chemistry makes it so that they shouldn't be taking drugs. They don't have good experiences on it. There are people who are allergic uh, to things. There are people who have negative reactions to things. Um, and when I say negative reactions, I'm talking, not talking about uh, evil spirits. I'm talking about, Hey, you have health conditions that that make this problematic, um, but in a world where I have a friend of mine, been, can't. And what's that? I said I have a friend of mine who can't drink tequila because uh, he just turns into this this mean, awful, horrible person on tequila. Um, but other alcohol, and he's just fine. He's a very happy uh, drunk, but tequila just turns him mean. Something in the the chemical makeup of it. So yeah, I. Drugs, why would drugs be any different than that? They're more powerful drugs than alcohol. Um, there's a, uh, it started off as a TikTok. I, I wish I could find who it was. Somebody's going to know. But there's uh, a lovely group of uh, country singing women who did a song about Delta 8 to the tune of Delta Dawn. Uh, oh. <laughs> And I, I'm not finding it right now, but it, it's like Delta eight ain't that bad, but it ain't that great. And they did a, a wonderful <laughs> job. I wish I could, I wish I could promote them. Somebody in chat, see if you can find who it is. I got a show to do. I can't go digging up all, all the funny songs I've, I've heard and, and wondered about, but, uh, we have more right. callers John in New York. Pronouncer he him is a theist that, uh, can make an argument that there should not be separation of church and state. So. John, welcome to the Hang Up. You're on with me and Jim. Please tell well, us why you. there shouldn't be separation of church and state. Well, for one, um, everybody, uh, if someone is deeply religious, 
then it's going to be impossible for them not to legislate based on their pre-existing ideas. So if someone is trying, is representing their district that's very Christian, to tell them to go out there and legislate or whatever their political uh, job is, uh, to not bring their religion into it, that's not possible because that religion is so, such a big part of how they would vote to begin with. Well, that, that's... So, first of all, our elected representatives do not have to check their religion at the door. They just aren't allowed to legislate their religion onto others. But that's... It, your point there is about what people might be likely to do. And I know plenty of religious yeah. people who don't actually enact the legislation of their... Of the, but your thing was that there should not be a separation of church and state. And I want to know why Correct. you think that. Well, I mean... For one, uh, your point earlier about that uh, it's not a reflection on character whether or not someone's Christian. If someone's Christian, they're more likely to be a better person. I mean, the book tells no, you to sir. be a good person. No, not no, that sir. They're no, no, sir, they're not more likely to be a better person. You don't have data to support that, but all of that is irrelevant. The issue here is you need to make a case for why there should not be a separation between religion and government. Why should there be a separation? I mean, it, I'm, this, is a, sorry, this John, should be a Christian. I'm sorry, John. I realize that you might be having difficulty here, but I didn't. you called in to say that there should not be separation of church and government. Is Correct. your position that you just can't think of a reason why it should exist and therefore it shouldn't? Or well, no, that's a, not. That's okay. that's only part. That's only a small part cool. of it. Um, then, then let's not waste any fucking time on something as stupid as that. Okay, which okay. religion? Which religion should the government not be separate from? Well, it should be connected to all religions. I mean, I'm Christian, so I'm biased towards Christian. But I think that we should allow all religions into government. No, no, no. Freedom of religion doesn't mean separation no, no, no. of church and state. What, That's what a, about, what about no, a death cult, no. like uh, a Kali death cult? Um, what about a who death cult? E human. Yeah, a death cult, like the Kali death cult from India. Um, right, or, right. Yeah. Well, I cults mean, aren't religions. Tribe, a humans religiously. So. Uh, okay. I, I don't, John. I don't. First of all, I'm having difficulty hearing Jim at all. And John, your audio is shit. There's some kind of. Uh, weird uh, noise. Oh, oh, that's the air conditioner. I'll turn that off. But, but I don't think you know what the separation of religion and government is because I'm in favor of members of any religion being a part of the government. The separation of religion and government is about whether or not people can legislate religious views as government laws. Oh, so, right. Right, so you're saying that you can't have, like, quotes in the Bible and the Constitution or amendments. No, or no, I'm not. And if you'd stop fucking interrupting me, you'd oh. get to the explanation. It means that you Go cannot ahead. legislate a particular religion as a government. You can't say, Jesus is the Lord of the United States. You can't say, you must be a Christian to do this. You must be a Scientologist to do that. You do not get to show preferential treatment for any religion over any other religion or religion over irreligion. That is what separation of religion and government is. Why do you think that no. we should violate that? Christianity is the correct religion. Okay. John, that's why it should be... All you're going to do is state your opinion and sound really stupid instead of making an argument. I'm not going okay, to okay, okay, okay. I'm on this I'll make call, my... and you know it. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Um, no, the, the reason that, that it should be, so it should, it shouldn't be that we force everyone to be Christian. It should be that by default, we prioritize Christianity over all other okay. religions. Oh, fuck yourself, John. I no longer care about your opinion. You have no yeah. argument. You have no justification for this. You don't understand that separation of religion and government is a, the very requirement that allows someone to be a Christian oh, I was getting to that. under this government. It is, it is a requirement to have separation of religion and government to allow for Christianity as well. Because if we No, this should be Hindu, a Christian state. Shut the fuck up, you ignorant piece of shit. If we implement Hinduism, you don't get to be a Christian anymore. You, 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 have, a, you have a flawed understanding of religion and government separation. And I don't care for your opinion at all. It is a waste of everyone's time, and we are all dumber for having listened to it. 
Goodbye, John. All right. I was going to say, okay, fine. Let's make it Quakers. Yeah. Or um, Amish. Amish would be good. I, I get, I'll go back John, to John isn't Lundies. serious. John, John isn't serious. He's not a serious caller. He's not a serious thinker. He doesn't have a serious point. Because, right. oh, well, obviously Christianity is the right one, but I think we should allow every religion in government. Well, all right. Yeah, there are a bunch of different religions, and they disagree on things. You cannot implement them all as functions of government because you have contradictory views. If we let the Muslims be in charge, we'd be able to have sex with four-year-olds as long as they started their period precociously. Really? Yes. I, I, there's a number. So Muslim apologists, by the way, are the dumbest apologists on the planet, as I've pointed out many times over the last five or six debates I've done. It's embarrassingly bad. But they're also some of the most immoral apologists on the planet, um, which is why they don't bother calling into this show to defend the garbage that is Islam. Uh, because what they'd rather do is try to get attention on Twitter and other places uh, by posting about how it's okay to for Muhammad to marry a six-year-old because he didn't have sex with her until she was nine. But if she had started having uh, precocious periods at the age of four, it'd be okay. Now, I don't want to live in a society where that is legislated as part of the government. And when you open up, as John ignorantly suggested, all religions that has to be in there. Yep. I, can't, I can't live in a world like that. Nobody should. It's absolutely vile. Yep. Meanwhile, Christianity is similarly vile in a number of its positions, where there's not equality between the genders, where women can't own property the same way, where it, it sanctions and allows for slavery. Okay, maybe it's not as bad as Islam on child rape, but they're both pretty bad. And no matter what Christianity is officially in favor of, the Catholic Church is a criminal organization that hides pederast priests and shuffles them around from, from parish to parish. And they're not the only ones. There's plenty of... Uh, it, it's hilarious how these right-wing religious folks want to call everybody a groomer and they're up in arms about drag queens. Uh, let's compare the number of drag queens that have ever been a risk to anybody's child to the number of priests who've been a risk to somebody's child. I don't need religion in government, and I don't need John with his incredibly ill-informed, insincere, uh, backward-ass views calling in to try to defend why we shouldn't have separation of, of church and state, why we shouldn't have separation of religion and government. We absolutely need it yeah. to protect atheist rights, to protect Christian rights, to protect Muslim rights. No matter how offensive I find them, we should not be legislating religion away. Anyway. But I'm a, couldn't have said it better. I, I just I get so irritated when you know there are some of us who take yeah. this stuff uh, seriously, and then there are others who want to call in with a joke, or, or obviously Christianity is the right religion and we should just be implementing it. Um, I, John, I don't believe you're a Christian, and whether you're a Christian or not, I don't need your help. I don't need your help on this show. I don't need your help working on church separation. I don't need you to call up and pretend to be particularly stupid uh, so that you're a straw man caricature of the callers. I would like for real sincere believers, whether you're a, a Protestant, a Catholic, a Muslim, a Scientologist, whatever, I would like sincere believers to call in and explain what they believe, why they believe it, why they think somebody else should believe it. If you're genuinely out there and you think there shouldn't be church state separation, and you're, you're, the only people who, who could reasonably do that are the ones who are advocating for something like Christian dominionism. And they're not going to hem and haw and say the government should be open to all religions. You're not, you have no idea how stupid you sounded, John. You don't represent any, any, any reasonable version of Christianity. I have Christian friends who are apologists, uh, or at least friendly acquaintances who are Christian apologists. Um, they know you're not real. You know you're not real. Find something better to do with your life. We have Nick in Kentucky, pronouncer he, him, who's been waiting for over an hour so that I could take calls from some of the dumbest fake Christians I've ever talked to. So, Nick, thank you so much for your patience. Welcome to the Hang Up with Jim Barrows and me. Hey, Jim and Matt. Hello, hello. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. 
Uh, yeah, it's nice to call into such an iconic duo. Uh, shame to hear all the trolls tonight. Is that normal? It happens from time to time. I, I think some of them have a kink of being owned and, and chastised. <laughs> and so I think some are sitting there, you know, dick in hand waiting for me to call them out because they need daddy to spank them. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, uh, related to the first announcement, uh, yeah, I live where identifying as an atheist, like at work, would definitely cause people to treat me differently. So, uh, like you, I would also just describe the whole situation as bizarre. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I, I can't have any atheist paraphernalia at work, and yet people have not just, you know, crosses everywhere, but also uh, some of the Hindu gods, posters of them as well. Uh, up. And yet my laptop with my atheist stuff on it is, is considered offensive. Uh, you know, so, yeah, I get it. Um, it is what it is. And uh, hopefully shows like this and, and more active, you know, other activists are doing part, you know, more than I do uh, can put a stop to it at some point. Uh, make everybody realize that they're being hypocritical. Yeah. And, um, well, so I actually wrote down my topic before the show even started, and I guess it kind of has to do with uh, the announcement. But anyway, uh, I was wondering how much responsibility do we really have to critique our beliefs? Um, I guess I've been reading and listening to philosophy for maybe three years and I still wouldn't say I like understand it as definitely not as well as most or some people but uh, yeah I feel like if I if I quit actively like ref refuting theism I feel like I'm no better than the person who's just going to the polls and voting based on beliefs they haven't like examined deeper, I guess. Uh, there's nothing wrong with not wanting to uh, debate theists anymore. Um, absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to do it in the first place. Um, just live your life the best you can and, and do what you can with what you got. Um, and if people ask, you can tell them or not, depending on the situation. Don't do anything that you don't feel comfortable with and don't assume that because a theist pops off with something you disagree with that you have to take him to task for it. You don't, um, yeah. you can just smile, nod and, and keep right on going and doing what you're doing. Um, there, there is no obligation to being an atheist or an activist. There, there's no call to, you know, the, unlike the Christians where, you know, they have a, a call to be a preacher. No, an atheism, if you want to go out and do it, do it. If you don't, don't. If you don't want to do it in the moment, that's fine too. So I don't think you're under any obligation to correct a theist whenever they're wrong or you think they're wrong. Yeah, I right. think. So, oh, go ahead. Nick, Nick, to kind of address this, there's, there's two prongs. One is, you know, how much responsibility do we have to have to critique our beliefs? Well, it depends on whether or not you'd like to share them. If you are going to present your beliefs to other people and say, here's what I think. Um, and I, I believe other people should probably share this, that I think it's reasonable, then I think you have a much higher um, requirement or to, to be able to critique that belief. Um, but if, when it comes to you know, understanding all philosophy or studying all of that, that may be completely irrelevant if you're not engaging in subjects like that. I spend a good deal of time calling out bad atheist arguments i've called i've, done, I've had several arguments matter of fact most of the arguments i've had this week have been with other atheists somebody posted the um uh, can god you know make a burrito so hot that he can't eat it or can god make a rock so big that he can't lift it and i i went after him and i'm like why are atheists posting these incredibly stupid memes that make us all look uninformed this is what the theist laughs at because it demonstrates that you don't understand anything substantive about theology that even within christendom um by the way the, the omnis don't exist literally in the bible 
they are interpreted and intuited from claims in there, hey, God is is all powerful. But that can be viewed as God is as powerful as it is possible to be. And therefore, when you say something like, can God make a rock so heavy he can't lift it? Um, you're talking about a power that isn't possible. Can God make an, um, a married bachelor, uh, a square circle, you know, th those sorts of things. And then there's others. There was a meme that got spread around that was some people s sitting in front of a priest and they were talking about, um, okay, so no meat on Fridays. Yes, that's correct. So that means no eggs for breakfast. And the, the priest's like, no, no, eggs are okay. And uh, they're like, uh, uh, it's it's essentially they they push back to be like it, it isn't isn't an an egg meat and the priest is something something like not until it hatches and they're like so the thing isn't the thing until it's born and the priest is like yes oh no wait a minute and they're using it as an analogy to show that there's a hypocrisy between the egg thing and uh, abortion except there's not because the position is that something doesn't become meat until it is fertilized and incubated prior to that it is egg it is a chicken product but not a chicken and similarly the position against abortion isn't whether or not it's meat it is also an insold creation of god that you should not destroy they don't have the same view of a chicken and so you're comparing when does a person become protected from destruction by other people and when does a chicken egg become meat that you can't eat on Friday? You're comparing apples and oranges there. And while it seems intuitive, it's wrong at every possible point. And yet it made the rounds. Oh my God, it was everywhere. I, I, oh, it's a, here it is. Here's the meme. Here's the meme. And I'm like, it's, it's stupid. And when theists see that, all they know is that it's an equivocation fallacy because one person wrote both sides of the argument. Do you know how easy it is? to create a compelling and yet flawed argument when you get to write both sides of it, it is preposterous. And the theists will look at that and go, wow, look how stupid these atheists are. They don't understand the difference between uh, when does a chicken count as meat and when does a person begin to exist such that we can't destroy it. It, it, is, it is a horribly flawed argument. But anyway, sorry, I got distracted because it was annoying. But <laughs> no, on, on your subject of... Do, do we have a responsibility to criti critique our beliefs? If you're sharing your beliefs, you should be able to defend them. If you're not ready to defend them, you should at least exercise caution when you share them and say, hey, I don't think I'm ready to dig in on this, but I'm kind of leaning towards this position. And that's perfectly reasonable. And I would add to the sharing, yeah. anytime your actions are going to impact somebody else, um, if those actions are based on your beliefs, you should probably examine them. I definitely agree with all of that. Um, I guess, I mean, uh, the sharing part, I guess I definitely don't have to interact with, you know, inter the internet theists, as you'd say. But uh, I, diff I do have, like, most of my family as uh, Catholics and stuff. And so... I don't know. I feel like I, I have a responsibility to be able to, I guess, although atheism isn't much of a position like Christianity is, I do feel like I have a responsibility to be able to defend, I guess, my justifications for things from from an atheist point of view. And, and if you if feel that, that way... Sense. Basically, you're saying you'd like to be able to engage with family members who have religious beliefs in a way that lets them understand who you are and potentially offers an opportunity for them to change your mind and you to change their mind. That's perfectly acceptable. But the key thing to remember is um, if you're not putting forth, they're the ones putting forth a proposition that a God exists, and so they have the burden of proof. You don't have to prove to somebody that their God doesn't exist, but you can teach them about the burden of proof, and you can say, uh, I'm just not convinced. And there's plenty of things, uh, plenty of discussions you can have which aren't too problematic or, or uh, don't put them in. They're always going to be on the defensive a little bit. Um, and you can tell when it's going badly when they try to put you on the defensive. How could you possibly say there is no such thing as God? 
you know, that sort of thing, uh, that kind of outrage, um, that's when the conversation changes and you need to be able to, to, to push back in a way that says, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is in much the same way that I'm not convinced there's fairies, the people who think there are fairies haven't provided sufficient evidence. It's probably going to piss them off just as much, but <laughs> I mean, it depends on what their beliefs yeah. are. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't have much to add to that, but, uh, yeah, I just cool. wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Um, well, thanks for calling Nick. I appreciate it. If you have other questions, you can reach yeah. out to us. You can also reach out to recovering from religion.org. Uh, and there's a number of websites in discord organizations where, you know, other people will have thoughts who may disagree with, with myself and Jim, but take oh, care, Nick. Thanks for that. Have a good show. Appreciate it. As a reminder, if you send in your super chats and those super chats are more than $10, they'll go into the list of super chats that Jim and myself will take turns reading at the end of the show. So once we're done with the callers, we will, we'll sit around. There's a, a few of them already in and I'm looking forward to, to getting to some of them. But if you have uh, questions, then we're going to read every super chat over $10. We're going to stay here until they stop coming in uh, at that. But also, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you can check out the Patreon for the network and become a regular supporter there. That is going specifically to a few uh, improvements. Number one, for people who are regular hosts on programs here or who would like to be regular hosts on programs here, um, there are some tech improvements that may need to be made on occasion. And so getting people access to um, a better camera, a better microphone, a better computer for people who are going to be on the shows on a regular basis we'd like to be able to help out with that. Um, additionally, we are working on LineCon for next year, which is going to coincide with a full total solar eclipse. And we're working on a number of other programs as well. We've got, I'm, I'm behind, but we've got work to do on uh, Endboss. And just, I don't know, if you want to make Jimmy feel incredibly uncomfortable, donate. Because stuff like that, just, you know, just send him a quick message. Go fuck yourself, Jimmy. Uh, but, in addition, this, if you don't like this show, first of all, I don't know why you're listening to me tell you anything, but you have the opportunity to watch a bunch of other shows on this network. I mentioned them all earlier. Let me run through what's coming up really quickly. And that is tomorrow on the Transatlantic Call-In Show, which starts at 2 p.m. Arden Hart is down the hall producing and just, you guys have no clue how awesome she is. I'm just saying, I'm not biased at all. That's just a fact. Uh, but she'll be on the show with Kara Griffin from Recovering from Religion. And this Sunday will be me and Jimmy on the Sunday show. Monday, Skep Talk will be John Gleason with special guests. I tell you, special guests just, I get so excited every time I see special guests. But on Tuesday, Dying Out Loud, Dave Warnock will have a, an, a special guest as well in Andrew Seidel. Um, all that, and I'll be back next week with another episode of The Hang Up. Jim, I know we got more calls to get to, and then we'll get super chats and everything else. Lest I forget, since you're one of those those folks that I get on not frequently enough and who never seems uh -huh. to have anything to promote, where can people find you and follow you outside? Have you, have you got some socials to, to share with people or something? Yes. Uh, Facebook, uh, James Barras, um, Twitter, and Threads now as well um, at all those places. So uh, you can I'm on find threads. me the usual places. I, I am on threads yeah, now as yeah, well. I'm following you on threads. It's it's uh, already it's much nicer. Get on. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I I I didn't I didn't target Elon Musk and call him sis, but I did block him on Twitter just to see. I heard someone say that if you block Elon, uh, eventually uh, at at some point he does like an unblock on everybody who's got him blocked. Um, and I'm like, well, that was worth $44 billion because I can reblock you. But yeah, somebody in yeah, chat just uh, did, regretting that decision. Somebody in chat just said, are Matt and Arden together? No, she's down the hall. Later. All maybe. right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll be together after the show's over. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah for, for a couple of years now. But, uh, 
Tanner in Pennsylvania, pronouns are he, him, has a question for us. Welcome to the show, Tanner. You're on the Hang Up with Jim and Matt. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just want to start by saying this is really cool. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of both of you. Um, I am the cliche, long-time listener, first-time caller. Um, I, I have two questions that I want to ask. The first one is, is really short and hopefully simple to answer. And it's, okay. when are you going to finish your book? Because I want a copy, and I would really like to meet you to have you sign it. And if you get it published, could you please allow for large enough margins uh, so we can take notes? Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. I'm not actively currently working on it. Uh, I wish I could tell you I was, uh, but I don't like to lie. And I can't. I, I will definitely do what I can to make sure that there's an opportunity for note taking and other stuff to whatever extent a publisher allows. I have four books okay. outlined, and one one of the problems is that, in addition to um, leaving one network and coming over here and, and and building up there, I'm also building a hobby slash business breeding exotic reptiles, and I still have conventions and gatherings and all kinds of stuff to go to and participate in and it's uh it, it's just a lot it's too much for me to actually add finishing a book in any in any point in the near future to that list i got it all right well, well I i'm still looking forward I appreciate to it. you asking <laughs> normally it Absolutely. really irritates okay. me when people ask because i know i have failed to do what i said i would do and that is cool. a a source of frustration and anxiety but i do appreciate your interest well, and your kind i do not Thank ever mean to have that but okay the real question or i guess the real reason i called was uh if, if i could just preface this just with a, a little bit of preamble just a tiny bit i know you hate it i'm sorry but if, if you would have asked me like anything about religion probably somewhere between five and eight years ago um i probably would have scoffed a little bit and, and said something like how obvious what how obvious it was that we were that humanity is like outgrowing religion is on the horizon okay um like if if not in my life i got to see a largely secular population uh you know my children or my children's children uh however in that that time frame i just alluded to there uh there have been a few events that have transpired um i guess for starters we, we elected a uh a reality TV star and buffoon by the name of Donald Trump into office. Um, buffoons like uh, Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson have just skyrocketed in popularity. Uh, otherwise, reasonable thinkers like like uh, Richard Dawkins seemingly turning heel on specific subjects. Um, with with these recent uh, court or Supreme Court case decisions that are just so obviously and blatantly corrupt and uh biased in favor of religion i guess i just i don't feel like it's over the horizon or around the corner anymore and i just why does it feel like reason is failing because it is is what it, so yeah. but you have to I, I prefer to look at the trend line which is there's positive and negative changes and for quite a while the trend has been towards the positive. There's always going to be setbacks. And so I look at what's happening in many cases, and it's like the last gasps of a, of a failing beast. And I don't just mean the beast of religion, but the beast of, you know, conservatives of, of a particular variety uh, of, of conservatism. But it, it's worse now. It feels worse now because it is worse now. We've lost the Supreme Court for perhaps a generation. Mm -hmm. We lost Roe. Um, there are people out there who, because of their access to more information than ever, um, and and how crippling that can be to a mind to make a decision in the face of that, and they have more and more reason to distrust information, which means they have more and more reason to distrust good information as well. Mm -hmm. um, that leaves even some of the people with the best intentions to rely on their gut rather than their brain because nobody has time to become an expert on all this stuff and nobody has time to investigate all this stuff. I don't, you don't, Jim doesn't. And so sure. there are setbacks. And the only thing that I can say is that I, I'm still confident that assuming we don't, you know, like climate change doesn't kill us all or nuclear war or something like that, that reason will win out 
in the end and that we will find a way to combat all the things that we're terrified of uh, ai and chat gpt and deep fakes and you know all this we will find a way but I suspect that things are going to go through a serious dip in a number of categories before there's sufficient or big improvement. How, how, what's your take on it now, Jim? How, how fucked are we? Yes, please um, tell me, Jim. I'm <laughs> a little bit more positive. Yeah, I'm a little bit more positive. I see this as, as a uh, dying gasp. And how long it'll last, I don't know. Um, but I see a number of, of conservatives now having to make a choice um, like especially single issue conservatives, um, like my mom, who is will vote for anybody who is anti-abortion. She doesn't really care, but now she has to, right? Because people are doing because of what they're doing is so antithetical to everything else that my mom stands for. These single issue voters can't continue to hold their nose um, and and vote for somebody just on that one single issue. Uh, I, I see that changing. Um, I see all of the gerrymandering that the Republicans are doing as clear evidence as they're very, very scared of what's going to happen if they actually let people vote. Uh, Texas is a big one. Tex Texas is uh, a, has a majority of minorities, right? They still have minority power because they can't get anyone in power, but Texas is gerrymandered that way. Um, and a number of other states are, too. I think it's Alabama that just got spanked by the Supreme Court and told to go back to the drawing board for the second or third time. There's one state that begins the name. Might be Alabama, might be Arkansas. I don't remember. Um, and, so, and that was a state Supreme Court. Um, you know, stacking the, the Supreme Court the way it is right now, I'm less concerned about it. I don't think Biden is going to try and stack it. But the next Democratic president might. Uh, decide to add some more folks to the Supreme Court. There's no maximum number, um, and that would help do some things. But I, I, I do see things turning, um, and I see people starting to actually care about the truth, not trusting as many sources as they used to, um, just willy-nilly. Um, and also, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter was. Um, I think the, the social media... Uh, companies are getting better at filtering out bot news and fake news and doing the, and doing things about it. Um, you know, there, whenever there's a surge like there was for the, the 2020, uh, you know, the, the previous elections, uh, the companies are always going to be bought. And I think we saw that. Um, I think they're climbing back up there. But, uh, you know, the, the bad guys are, are clever, too. So we'll see what happens. But I'm just I'm slightly more positive. Um, just because, you know, 20 years ago, the, the Republicans weren't gerrymandering as nearly as hard. They weren't going nearly as hard on mm. denying people the right to vote uh, as they are now. And part of that is because they do have power. But I also see that as a, uh, a, a problem, right? Because most of the, the policies of the Democrats, the, the, they, they poll well. Um, the Democrats just have, you know, but the conservatives who are polling on that and are polling for democratic policies positively uh, don't seem to see that yet. And, and I think they're going to do that. Um, you know, this, this latest advertise, uh, advertisement by the uh, Joe Biden campaign, where they basically just let uh, Marjorie Taylor <laughs> Greene run her mouth. <laughs> uh, it's one of my favorite of things that. that has ever happened. <laughs> Yes, it is absolutely wonderful. And he just says at the end, I'm Joe Biden, I approve of this. It's yeah. like, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I see, I, I tend to be a little more positive um, about it um, than, than Matt was. But, you know, it, it all just kind of depends on, on what we need to do. And we just, we need to change our voting. We need to get past, we need to get rid of first past the uh, post type voting. And we need to do just some sort of ranked choice, or if there's a better system out there, use it. Um, I find them all. And ranked. I say that knowing full well that. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and, I, and I say that knowing full well that ranked choice can put yeah. candidates I don't like in power. I'm not saying that because it'll make Democrats more powerful. I'm saying that because it's it's the most it's a more fair system than what we have now. So. Okay. No, I mean I'm. <laughs> I'm satisfied with the answers. They're positive, at least, which is which is uh, better than I've been thinking. So that's 
that's a plus. And and I apologize if I sounded uh, nervous or, or or scratchy. It's just I'm passionate about it, and I, I I love listening to you guys. You guys are like superheroes to me. So I'm, again, I'm sorry, but <laughs> no. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I'll, I'll let you get on to other callers. I, I appreciate the uh, the words. Thank you. Thanks so much. Actually, have, have a good time. Yeah, Find yourself a some better Bye. superheroes. <laughs> I mean, at least one of them. Jim Jim's great, but uh, yeah, I don't need the. I don't need the world's biggest fan stuff. I appreciate the fact, though, that our, our input is is valued. Um, that's nice. And uh, I don't want to diminish that. But it's, the other thing to remember is um, we are now in a position where what you think about the world is, like always, based on the information you get. But we live in a world where each of our various social media things have algorithms that tailor so that you can get either more of the same, which can give you much like the nightly news. If it bleeds, it leads. And so you tend to hear more about the bad things in the world than the good things in the world because those things um, get attention. Similarly, once you start getting a parade of uh, similar posts, you're going to get more of that. But the other thing you can get is what people pay to put in front of your eyes. Um, I have a, a beyond incognito browser that's on a completely divorced account where I can go out and just see, uh, here's all the various news feeds. Here's CNN, Fox, MSNBC, Al Jazeera, um, and a number of others as well, so that I get a good idea of what, but still, that still depends on what they put on their website, what they push forward and everything else. It is worth remembering um, that, that old adage about believe half of what you see and none of what you hear. It may be less than that. Believe a quarter of what you see and uh, less than nothing of, of what you hear <laughs> at this point. It's, it's worth it for us to be um, as dubious as we can, uh, can be and, and suspicious, but that doesn't, means exercise critical thinking and skepticism, not cynicism. And I see that there's still three atheist callers on the line, but we'll take, uh, if we don't get any more theist calls, these will be the last three calls. Um, I appreciate people waiting. So we have cumulative in Canada. Pranzer Hehem wants to, uh, wants to, wants us to come up with a, a catchy truth. So welcome cumulative. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, long time listener, sometimes caller. <laughs> but um, yeah, I find it very frustrating to talk about something like this doesn't just apply to religion, but many things where there's like a colloquial, just some colloquialism, like such as fat makes you fat, um, where the truth is much more nuanced. And if you try to explain the truth, then you look like you're losing because the truth is so much more wordy. So I'm wondering if it, if it would be possible to uh, to to have uh, to, to spread catchy truths that, that aren't nuanced, or if that's maybe a, an uphill battle, something that's maybe impossible even. Well, like what? Um, here's the thing. I haven't come up with one myself, <laughs> but like, okay. So, um, the fat makes you fat thing I got from a, um, a show called Adam ruins everything where, uh, apparently, uh, from what I remember, from what I can recall, uh, it was something that, like, the sugar um, sugar farmers uh, basically m slid sugar in where fat used to be so that people could you know, avoid fat in their foods, look at low-fat foods, but wouldn't realize that the sugar is just as bad or worse, that, that consuming sugar in place of fat um, still causes their bodies to convert that uh, carbohydrate into fat and store it anyway. Um, but, like, there's no... I can't think of a way to say that um, as a counter to fat makes you fat. I mean, the I, I'd like to say that common sense says that you don't like don't load up your foods with fats and sugars anyway, but like they are what our body uses for energy. So it's not it's not as easy as just cutting them out or um, yeah. Like it, I'm just not finding the words, you know. And, and I think that's part of the problem. Um, yeah. It's very difficult for people to to find the words that you'd like to use. 
that you think perhaps might be useful. The, the problem is we've trained people, and I think this is, this is perhaps your, your complaint to some extent, we've trained people to, to rely on the McNuggets uh, of reality rather than the facts of reality. Yeah. I, and I don't know that we have any reason to think, first of all, the truth is difficult to teach people. And, you know, there's the old quote from Mark Twain that uh, a lie can make its way halfway around the world before the truth can even lace up its shoes. <laughs> it's really easy to toss out bumper stickers that simply aren't true, and it takes more than that to counter it. And the more untruth bumper stickers you throw out there, the, the more it seems like there's more information. I've... I've heard it from 83 different sources. Yes, but they're all the same source. And the bigger problem is that when you're trying to take truths and distill them down to McNuggets and bumper stickers, uh, I don't know that, that they're remotely effective because the truth isn't even always as appealing as a lie is going to be. So, I mean, yeah. if fat doesn't make you fat, apart from just creating another bumper sticker that says fat doesn't make you fat. Well, now <laughs> all you've got is two bumper stickers that take two opposite things. And so at, yeah. at best you're in a position where you don't know. And it's less catchy too. It doesn't have that rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and like, I, okay, there's one. I think you're always I, in I thought of, of well, Oh, sorry. Go when ahead. When you have quips like that, I think you're, yeah, you're always in danger of, of, getting yourself into trouble there too because people will attack the dumbest possible interpretation of what you said and i think the the example of that is black lives matter and that mm, phrase yeah. and what conservatives have done to it right um because nowhere in there do you get the idea that other lives don't matter right but conservatives attack that that meaning of it even though that is not what is meant and that that you're all and it because it is such a short clip and it is accurate that just makes them all vulnerable to that type of attack and so i i you know we shouldn't shy away from uncomfortable truths or long truths um mm, okay just to j j just for marketing purposes so okay so what i'm getting from that is we we could attack the dumb interpretations of their catchphrases sure yeah, and well no you should well <laughs> you can uh, I would still like to see people still man it, um, still man okay. our, our mm -hmm. interlocutor positions. Um, but you know, humor is always a good thing, and yeah. as long as it's <laughs> done, as long as you're not being mean, then make it humorous yeah. is, is fine because yeah. humor also can convince. But and then sometimes if you're just tired and feeling snarky, <laughs> all right. Yeah, actually, one um, catchy truth came to mind while, uh, like, just after I said that first bit, and that was trans women are women. It's It's got a rhythm to it. It's got a catchiness to it. And it's I think it's difficult to attack. It's not difficult to ignore, and it's not difficult um, uh, to wrongly attack. Um, it, see, here's the problem. If you want, a, if you want a, a bumper sticker that is significant and true, that's harder than a bumper sticker that is cute when you don't care about having to make it truthful. It's, it's trivially easy to make up some bullshit and make it rhyme. It's a little harder to make something poignant, prescient, and true rhyme. And the same thing is true for whatever, you know, McNuggets and bumper stickers you're going to try to do. <laughs> yeah. It I is. mean... Uh my follow-up question would to that would be can we then deceive people towards the truth like use I, a little I bit of that never, i would never advocate for that uh because uh. here's the thing if you convince someone to believe something that's true for bad reasons all right when they find mm -hmm. out those reasons are bad they no longer have a reason to believe uh, okay all right. I, I guess it, it, that does it's, open it's my exactly, eyes. It's exactly what we're trying to do with religions. Religions yeah. have convinced people that something is true when it's not, and they've done it for bad reasons. And we are taking away those bad reasons to give people good reasons to disbelieve.
Okay. That, that does open my eyes towards some strategies towards attacking the catchy falsities, at least. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll have to think about this some more, and hopefully uh, the, the problems that arise from this will be uh, lessened. <laughs> <laughs> like in my, yeah, I think about like some online conversations I had years ago that I probably wouldn't be able to uh, revisit today. But just, yeah, where we're, I try to explain something and someone is just like, but, <laughs> and that's just like everybody else in the conversation is paying attention to that and just completely forgets the argument that I made earlier, that kind of thing. Yeah. Happens in online arguments all the time. Happens in conversations <laughs> too. Yeah. Doesn't it make it feels like it's annoying just, sometimes. Yeah. But. Yeah. Like it, it feels like I gotta, I gotta um, collect some memes for responses in order to, to sharpen my point. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you for this conversation. Oh, are you still doing the thing where the caller gets to hang up on the, um, on the hosts? For you, go right ahead. Tell me I'm done. Cuss me out. Whatever you want. Finish it off. Don't you science me. See? <laughs> That's pretty there catchy. I'll give you full credit for catching yeah. us there at the end of that. Yeah, it's, it'd be nice. I, I don't ever want to build, try to build truth on lies. Tearing down lies is difficult. And when you have a world where people are simultaneously uninformed and misinformed and not trained with the tools to be able to tell when those things are the case, um, it's much easier to convince them of bad ideas and to then quote yep. Voltaire. Um, if you can convince people of absurdities, you can get them to commit atrocities because when you convince people, for example, that, uh, the libs, the atheists, uh, they're all groomers that they're coming after your kids, that this is, you know, there's a pedophile ring and all this, uh, once you convince them of that, you can get them to, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know any other way to phrase it, start lining people up against the wall, both figuratively in the mm -hmm. sense of taking out their rights and everything else, but that leads to um, things like civil war. All right. Two more and then Super Chats. Jerry in Illinois is an atheist pronouncer. He him and has a question for us. Welcome to The Hang Up. You're on with Matt and Jim. Hi, Matt. Hi, Jim. Uh Long time listener, uh, second time caller. I didn't quite get online to get it with you a few years ago, but um, essentially what I was wondering about is, as an atheist, how do you prevent yourself from falling into the same pitfalls of hate that evangelicals find themselves in? Because even though you have a different ideology, oftentimes there is a prejudice and animosity there that's very similar and even identical. Hmm. Jim, why don't you hate the Christians? I wouldn't say that I... I say that I'm struggling with feelings of animosity toward Christians. I'm trying not to presuppose what kind of person they are based on their views, just like I tell them not to do, or beg them not to do. And it's hard to keep myself out of that trap because see how much evangelism is destroying this country or at the very least making things very bad and difficult for people like us in this country yeah i was actually kind of tossing it over to jim to see what he says about why he doesn't and maybe he does jim do you hate christians just in general no um i don't find the negative emotions to be productive or useful in most cases. Um, I mean, some people will say, well, hate, hate gives you energy. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't really need that kind of energy. I'd much rather, uh, oh, I definitely agree. And, and let, yeah. So I, I just, I don't find any useful in, in, in any of that for, uh, for any reason. Um, well, I, I guess, I guess what I mean uh, is how do you, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. If they say things, then you can kind of make, you can come to conclusions about uh, where they lean, you know, uh, 
in their ideology, but uh, to hate them for that just doesn't make any sense. Well, I agree. I guess what I'm saying is over it's conscious thought versus emotional tugs. And I'm really trying to detach myself from those emotions or at the very least keep them in check because I do know they're not correct. Yeah. Uh, it's So um, it's not easy. I mean, it, 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 what you're talking about is we're all human. Psychologically, we are predisposed um, to fall into thought traps like that that are essentially, hey, um, this is a bad person. I recognize that. I need to think of them as a bad person. And uh, it, this is not remotely something that is easy to avoid, but I think the recognition that that is a real consequence uh, where you're already asking the question aids in the conscience conscious effort not to do it i look i'm let me, let me do it this way it's been almost 20 years that i have sat in a studio or in my room and taken live <laughs> calls from believers some of whom are among the stupidest and most immoral and disgusting people i've ever interacted with some of whom are genuinely wonderful and we just disagree a little bit and i have handled callers from both extremes amazingly and i have handled callers from both extremes terribly because i'm a human being. oh i've watched a few uh, sorry go ahead yeah because i'm a human being and i'm not going to get it right all the time but the one thing that happens and what i consciously did ages ago is I try to make sure that people get as good as they give, that I don't necessarily go negative first, um, that whatever reaction I get, I would be okay with it were I on the other side of the call. And I'm not always gonna get it right, but I, it's very rare, like in the, in the 20 years of taking calls almost, I don't know if I can think of a single caller that I genuinely hate. I've, I can think of callers that I, I despised the call and I despise the views that they espoused and I no longer care to interact with them. Um, I've had callers, uh, we've banned callers. We banned callers on atheist experience, on nonprofits, on talk, well, not on a Yeah, there was one ban on nonprofits when Dennis and I were still taking calls. Uh, on Talk Heathen, on, on the shows here, people get banned. Is it always the right solution? Nah. Uh, is it quite often the right solution? Yeah, I think actually it is. But do you feel like be, um, it's a good? Sorry, sorry. No. There might be in twenty years, two or three people where I genuinely would say, at least for a period of time, I hated the person. Um, I can tell you this: there are more atheists who I despise right now for things they've done directly to me and to the movement, then there are theists that I despise. Mostly my, my take on, on theism is I was there, uh, there but for the grace of no God uh, w went I, and, and, and I could have been there. And so, you know. Well, that's one of the things that prompted me to, uh, sorry. Uh, it's never going to be easy. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things that that's actually one of the, one of the things you just said is one of the things that prompted me to call is, um, oh, and I'd like full disclosure. Uh, I'm a diagnostic, so I do have flight of ideas a lot. Uh, so if I have some inordinate pauses, I apologize. But uh, it's it's very uh, it very difficult to I, I guess something I really wanted to ask you was is it hard for you to have that so, like do you feel like you need to hang up on people for your own sanity sometimes I mean I'm, I'm sure you do I can see you getting frustrated quite often on the show yeah and, and I'll tell you and would um, you sorry go, go ahead no no I finished your thought no and uh uh, blocking it out 
it was like, or not blocking it out so much as learning to separate idea from person. Yeah. So I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you two things, uh, fairly quickly here. One is about forgiveness. Um, I, my take on forgiveness is you don't forgive people for their benefit. You forgive them for your benefit so that you don't feel the need to keep carrying that weight around because the odds are for people who have done you wrong in some way, whether this is about, you know, serious disagreements over religion or not, um, they probably aren't sitting around going, ha 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 ha. I ruined their life. That, that's probably not what's happening. And yet you are probably sitting around going, oh man, they ruined my life. And so the longer you let that stay and linger, the more they're ruining your life. Similarly, I to thank the... you. Sorry, what? Sorry, I just wanted to clarify what you were saying for a second. So in a sense, forgiveness is more of a rebuke than a relenting. It, it, Forgiveness is a release for you so that you don't have to keep carrying it. But there's another aspect to this because, for example, um, it's not easy. There are, there are a couple of individuals in the atheist community who, hi, hi kitty cat, who I used to count as my friends, who I now despise with pretty much every fiber of my being, and I don't see that ever changing. Because when there's a betrayal, um, you have to make a choice. Now, do I sit there and let the incidents that happened impact me every day? No, but they don't get forgiven because I want to hang on to that memory so that I don't ever have that happen to me again. There's a way to take those incidents and use them uh, in your favor. And the reason I mention that, and no, we're not getting into who and all that, but the reason I mention that is because you're oh, I'm aware. About... <laughs> no, you're not. At least to some extent. No, you're not. Oh, oh, I apologize. I apologize. I shouldn't have assumed. I shouldn't have assumed, guys. Um, the reason I mention that is because the same type of thing that you could hang on to while you're like, oh, I despise what these theists believe or present or whatever else. There's a way hanging on to that can be beneficial to you, and there's a way where hanging on to it could be poison to you. And you need to figure out which one it's going to be in every scenario, and then you, you either let it go or you don't. So it's just like morality in the sense that it's objective morality that's situational have to decide for each individual case what the correct course is yeah yeah anyway that that was a long right. diversion that was probably more cathartic for me than it was for you anyway so we're gonna move on to the final call of the day all right thank you very much guys i appreciate it uh sorry again for presuming i hope you weren't too insulted uh you guys have a great evening yeah no worries me too now, th there's a lot of stuff that people know about and there's a lot of stuff that people don't know about and they certainly don't know all the specifics, yeah. and it doesn't really matter. Finally, finally, the rock has come back to no. Uh, finally, we have Ryan, um, is it, from Nebraska, I believe. He, pronouns are he him, uh, is challenging book banning in his town and wants some advice and perspective. So, um, welcome, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you both for taking my call today. Uh, I. Like you said, Matt, I just had a couple questions and would like some advice. And first question would be, are you gentlemen familiar with the group Moms for Liberty? Yes. I'm not. Yeah, right wing, yeah they're right-wing conservatives um, who are yeah behind some book ban burnings and, or book bans and some other nefarious right-wing nonsense hmm. yeah that they, they their primary goal is they want to get books out of that have already been approved by boards of education uh out of schools that have lgbtq themes 
uh, that present minorities in a positive light or present Christianity in a negative light. And recently we had a school board member in my very small Nebraska town uh, from the larger town of Omaha cash a check from this group and get elected to our school board. She immediately uh, motioned to have a bunch of these books removed from our school library. They did so, which was against their, their own policy. And uh, we actually had a staff member quit because of, uh, because of this. So there was a large outcry. The students had a protest and we created a Facebook page. And I personally started a petition to recall this member because we don't want this, you know, keep this in Florida. <laughs> keep this MAGA crap out of my town. And uh, the, there was a, a compromise that was just recently made this month where the books were allowed to come back onto shelves and the students will be allowed to check out the books that have been challenged with parental permission. And everyone seems to think that that's a wonderful compromise. And gentlemen, I think it's bullshit. Um, because anyone with an agenda can now come in and challenge books, and they put the onus on us to have to, you know, take an extra step to read our, to let our children read these materials, whereas, you know, it should be on them, you know, to present this list and say, I don't want my children to check these books out. So my question is, uh, it, am, am, I, am, am I nuts in thinking that this compromise is, is bullshit? <laughs> Well, I, I can't comment on your sanity, but I, I do think it is bullshit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it is bullshit. I think um, on touting FFRF um, and possibly the Satanic Temple um, for some legal uh, aid or some uh, some advice uh, is probably not with you know probably a good idea. Um, Okay. I, you know, you could also go the route of if they've actually created policies and they're banning those books under those policies, then go do what some other folks have done. Go look at the policies, find out where the Bible violates these, and then violate the Bible out of the, the reading as well um, based on those policies and force them to realize that uh, there is no policy against pornography that it cannot be applied to the Bible and et cetera. But I, th I think contacting uh, the appropriate organizations um, for some legal advice would also be helpful and also to bring some more attention to the problem. I want to make sure I understand this. They had banned a bunch of books. People complained. They let the books back in, but now in order to check them out, you have to have basically a permission slip from your parents to check a particular book out. Correct. I'm not sure that you have any legal grounds uh, or any likelihood to challenge or change that because the culture in the United States favors parents allowing um, great control. Over, it's just, just in the same way that, um, you know, you need to get permission slips from parents to participate in, in, in any number of things. I would think that getting a parent's permission slip to check out a particular book from the library um, is going to be on the extreme low end of a burden of proof. I mean, we have a we have a compelling reason to want to teach kids scientifically sound uh, sex education, and we we would probably mm -hmm. require permission slips for that, even though it's essential. I don't know that what, while you and I might think that a particular book. Um, that just happens to have LGBT characters in it uh, is I'm okay, overwhelmingly positive, but I don't know that it is um, anywhere near the level of what we should be teaching. Uh, you know, as part of a there's a difference between something that's part of the curriculum and something that you just get from the library. And so, mm -hmm. if the only objection now is that kids need a permission slip from their parents to do it, then you're in a position where the library has these books 
And um, maybe kids will just forge their parents' permission slips in order to read that. But also, it's not the job of every public school library to have an exhaustive collection of books. It'd be nice if they did. Uh, but maybe sometime you're going to have to go to the public library. Maybe you're going to have to read some stuff online. Maybe you're going to have to read from the bookstore. I think what you should do is on Tuesday, call into Dying Out Loud because Andrew Seidel will be on the show and ask okay. him what he, his thoughts are on the law pertaining to it. Because as much as I'd love for all books to be available to all kids everywhere, and I understand that some kids' parents are never, ever, ever going to let them read some books that they could really benefit from, that doesn't yeah. mean that I get to have a say in that. I, I'm always cautious when it comes to dealing with other people's children. And, and mm -hmm. I, I'm a huge proponent of favoring, favoring liberty. I don't know. Uh, wait, somebody's saying, I missed the part where these books didn't require parental permission. I literally just asked, and he told me that they do require parental permission. So I don't know what you think I missed, inevitable. But... I wonder if he's pointing out, if he's saying that before they they did not require parental permission and based on this person's right-wing extremist agenda, now they do. I, I don't know if yeah. that was maybe his I point. don't know that it, I don't think it matters that they didn't require, I realize yeah. they didn't require permission before and that this was the compromise. Uh, yeah. But if, if you're saying that, well, they didn't require him before, okay, so fucking what? That doesn't mean that this isn't the appropriate compromise. And even if it's someone that you and I would object to, it doesn't mean that we have any sort of grounds to, to challenge it. Uh, but got it. Anyway, that's my take. No, I, I completely appreciate that. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I've been a follower of yours, of course, Matt, and also yours, Jim, for so many years. And, um, I, obviously, I can email you with specifics on how you've helped me in my journey, but allow me just to vocalize it and just say thank you to both of you and uh, let you get on the Super Chats and thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciate it. We are, in fact, moving on to Super Chats. So if you had questions um, or wanted to challenge myself or Jim on something that you didn't actually get a, a phone call in, by all means, get your Super Chats in now. I'm hitting refresh right here. I'm looking at the queue. And holy moly, we're going to be done with Super Chats in no time. You guys have, here, let me channel my inner, inner Jimmy. You guys have utterly failed to put in Super Chats um, that, are, that are going to keep us here for a long time. But you know what? I bet some more come in while we're talking about this. Nine ninety nine from Melody yeah. Kate, a bonus troll stomping. Yeah, I, I, we, we got extra <laughs> troll stomping today. Thank you so much, Kate. Appreciate it very much. This one's you, Jim. We'll, we'll alternate if you can see him. Uh, $10 from the Raven 200. Hail, Super Strawberry. Praise their might. Praise their might. May Super Strawberry bless your drinks. Jimmy, go. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Uh, yeah. $10 from RPG Dunks. I think an infinite universe is a scary thought to some people because in their minds, that would supersede the need for a god. If it existed forever, there's no need, need for a creator. Rock on, you two. Uh, yeah. It's, I don't, yeah, I, yeah. I, I love things I, like I this that, too, let me pause to think. Yeah, I, I think too, we need to make sure we're using, you know, universe should refer to the this local presentation and Cosmos should probably refer to everything else that may or may not exist outside of this universe, just to be pedantic. Um, well, that would always yeah, be my it, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, don't disagree that, that it's part of that is because where do you need a God for any of that? Right. Yeah. I think, I think that may be something. Um, if it turns out RPG debunks that, that this thought scares people because then they might realize that there's, there's no need for a God or no room for a God. Um, maybe we can come up with a pithy truth that makes it less scary. Like nothing in the universe is spying on you. 
<laughs> except that's not true because there's plenty of things in that we've created that are spying on us but nothing beyond humans are, are spying on you um yeah i think if they really sat down and thought about the impact of here's an infinite or an, an eternal creator that i'm positive as an explanation for a finite uh, universe um the prospect of an eternal universe of or an eternal cosmos as a foundation for their the only difference is whether or not it's a sentient agent and if we were to say here's your bumper sticker the cosmos need not be sentient and now you're not saying that it's not just that it doesn't appear to need to be sentient yeah. maybe that's not as scary Ten dollars from Diane Upshaw. Just happy to have time to be here tonight. Missed all of you, and I hope Jimmy has been uh, effing himself regularly. Well, I'm hoping that he's um, he's feeling better. I, I I talked to him a little bit today. He helped out with some technical issues that we had. We did a live. Arden and I did a live uh, Epic Loot Exotic Snake Stream to show off the four uh, new baby snakes that just had their first shed. Uh, where we we managed to sex them. They appear to all four be uh, females. Uh, we showed off their morphs. I am, by the way, going to be doing some live streams over the next week or two uh, to talk about snake genetics and complete dominant traits, dominant traits, uh, recessive traits, allelic combinations, or acts like supers, uh, the various complexes that we know about in ball pythons, uh, all leading up to the various we've got an incubator full of eggs and several more that are getting ready to lay new eggs. Um, so if you have any interest at all in that, please make sure you go look up Epic Loot Exotics. Uh, I, I'm pen pimping Epic Loot Exotics more than my own personal Patreon, uh, which is how I actually get paid. So you might also want to go to patreon.com slash atheist debates because, and this is, this is no bullshit. I'm not just promoting it because I, I mentioned I should have. Uh, in addition to the debate that I did just the other day, which I'll, I'll get posted tomorrow, I've been asked to do another debate next Friday, and I've agreed to do that uh, at Modern Day Debates on whether or not Christianity is true, because, you know, I need a break from, from smashing Muslims. Uh, but, oh, smashing Muslims, it sounds like I'm having sex with them. Oh, all right. They're fucked either way. <laughs> but I somebody posted a meme that, the way my brain works spiraled me down a line of thought. And one of the videos I'm going to be recording over the next few days is going to be the Highlander argument against Christianity. And it may or may not be what you think, um, but it has nothing to do with there can be only one, uh, even though it is absolutely tied to Highlander there and not Highlander 2. Although I might mention Highlander 2, even though it's a complete abomination uh, that should never well, have been made. It's not ever mentioned Highlander 2. Just, yeah, never it, mentioned it. Second it might come up preemptively, perhaps, but yeah. Is this one me? Ten dollars Canadian, ten dollars yes. of alleged money from War Boss. You know what I'd love to see? Matt and Jimmy sitting down together watching to show Veggie Tales. I had to watch it so much as a kid. Seeing him take it apart would give me a laugh. Go fuck yourself, Jimmy. I've never, ever watched Veggie Tales. I'm too old. I so maybe either. we will. Also too old. That would be kind of fun. Maybe we will. Uh, $10 from Dante Verona. I wonder in the end if Trump becomes a convicted felon for crimes he committed before he was president, when he was president, after he was president, any commentary? Um, yeah, I think that uh, there's a better than even chance that uh, he will be convicted uh, for a number of crimes because um, he's... Uh, well, he he had the the fraud bit, which he got twenty uh, individual counts for that one for, for that one bit of fraud that he got nailed twenty or thirty of them. Uh, then he's got what four other people, states investigating him for various things. Um, I don't think that it, that he can get away from all of them. I think people just need to be patient and realize that sometimes uh, justice takes a while, especially when you're going after an ex president. The problem is and and i don't know i i'm i'm really reluctant to speculate too much about trump in particular because part of me thinks that he's never going to like serve a day in prison 
and and there may be legal reasons why he he can't um or we're gonna have to change we're gonna have a constitutional crisis one way or another um but it's 2023 it's we're we're halfway through it we're coming up on an election year if they don't manage to convict him and he runs and wins now the constitutional crisis gets even worse in in that you know can he pardon himself well i guarantee you we're going to find out if he wins we're going to find out that's going to be put to the test as to whether or not he can pardon himself meanwhile if he gets convicted um does the current president or a future republican president go ahead and pardon him anyway you know I, i one of the more interesting questions is how many people in your inner circle can be can plead guilty be convicted go to prison while you stay protected that's right that's a bizarre world to live in i I genuinely don't know how the 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 various uh getting the evidence they need to go after him right you take out all the lieutenants before you go after the 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 mob boss so yeah i think it's gonna agree if it lasts you know if he manages to get elected again in 2024 that's going to be a problem and it will be a constitutional crisis so no i think i think jim's completely right that's how you that's the best way to build a case you know against the mob boss is you get all the underlings to make plea deals to testify to become convicted to serve time and then when you what you do is you walk in and you say here's this one guilty 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 testimony 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 all of it leading up to the kingpin at the top uh how do you not convict under those circumstances and i don't know eleven dollars from the raven 200 hey matt and jim if you ever get a chance read a pickle for the knowing ones by timothy dexter it's a beautiful disaster of literature short and front all right okay hang on i need a pickle for the knowing ones a book by timothy dexter oh it's on project gutenberg so what year was this written 2013 what why does it look like it was written in the 12th century all right i've got i've got it open so uh i'll be able to take a look at it what wait what just happened to my oh instead of opening a new tab i opened an entirely new browser that was uh that almost caused a problem Here's the next one for you, Jim. Uh, Eleven dollars on the Raven two hundred. There's only a few people I genuinely hate. There are specific individuals who wronged me, my loved ones. Hating general groups of people would be irrational and bad for my sanity. Hail Super Strawberry. Um, yeah. I think hating in in general is is bad for your sanity, but that's just my opinion. Yep. It's it's why I try not to. Um, but but there are a couple. Yeah. $20 in more alleged money from Ian Small. Love the line and religiously watch the Sunday show. Keep it up. Thank you so much, Ian. Appreciate it. Unless it's Ian. Damn. I do that. I have a friend whose name is Ian, and I still default to Ian. I think Ian's the most common one. So hopefully I got that right. You don't have to donate another $20 Canadian to tell me that I got it right. You can just say it in chat. But if you wanted to donate another $20 Canadian to tell me I'm right, I'm not going to stop you. Because, you know, I'm dangerous like that. Ten dollars from <laughs> ten dollars from Flavio Mello. Hopefully, I pronounced that right. Greetings from Brazil. Well, greetings well, all the way from up here in the United States. I've I've never been yeah. to Brazil. I'd love to go. Yeah, same here. Uh, I have no skill at Portuguese, uh, but yeah, Brazil yeah. is. I, I'll tell you. Uh, I've mentioned it before. I don't know what the laws are with regard to importing and exporting, but for those people uh, who are in South America, particularly Southern Brazil, if you are able to get the snake, Xenodon hystricus, um, (laughs) which is also known as Jan's hog snake. 
It is a tricolor hog snake that is gorgeous, that I desperately want to breed. I don't know about the laws for exporting it from Brazil or importing it from Brazil, but Histerodon, or sorry, Xenodon Histricus. Um, I, I just love this snake and uh, provided it's not illegal. Um, I desperately want one. And so if anybody down there, if you can find uh, hist uh, Xenodon Hystricus, the Jans hog, tricolor hog nose snake, uh, I would love, love, love to get my hands on a breeding pair of those. I'll take just one if I can, but a breeding pair would be nice. $10 from Mall. Hey, I am Tanner, who called in earlier, and I just want to say thanks again, and that I felt like I had to call in if I was going to sit in my chair and laugh at those who do. Sorry for super fan stuff. No problem. No, no worries. Problem at all. Thank you so much, Tanner. Appreciate it. Hey, I'll take this next one. I know it's my turn, but I really want to. Oh, right. it's from Arden. But Jerry Patika sent in a sticker for thirteen ninety nine Canadian, and that deserves a thank you. I wish I could have seen the sticker. Um, it, Normally, we're just reading super chats because there's not something to read on a sticker. But I'm gonna thank you so much, Jerry. It for you, okay? Oh, Are you ready? Get excited! Hang on, there's Chad. a voice from above to describe this. The sticker is a blue animal that kind of looks like a hippo. It's unclear. The nose kind of gives me hippo vibes, but that's about as close as I can get to telling you what animal this is. It's wearing a <laughs> yellow shirt and a pink baseball cap. Turns the cap around and gives you a big thumbs up. Very cool. Thank you. Well, kind of want to find a hat so i can turn it around and give you a thumb up back but thanks jerry <laughs> yeah all righty ten dollars from rc d rc deshan i think i remember jim once talking about an alternative hypothesis for the big bang theory uh we're gonna learn more about it get effed by a cactus jimmy uh alternative to the big bang i don't uh i, I used to talk about one talking about oh okay mark lowey um Is that the... yes okay mark lowey was a a physicist and a friend of mine um who was a longtime contributor uh to atheist community of austin stuff um he died uh, a couple of years ago and he was working with some other physicists on an alternate cosmology to challenge the current Big Bang model. I saw some physics news the other day that suggests the universe may turn out to be twice as old as previous models. I don't know enough about what's going on there, but I do know that the, the model that Mark was working on, uh, I didn't get the impression that it would double the age of the universe. It just was a potentially more accurate uh, model to describe like the cosmic microwave background radiation confirmed predictions made by current big bang cosmology but there's a lot of problems and missing stuff with regard to dark matter dark energy which are the labels we we put on shit we don't know quite mm -hmm. frankly and so he was working with other physicists on a a competing model but i don't think it would have been ready anytime soon and i didn't have more information from him and unfortunately, yeah, um, RC, he died. Yeah. I've had some, some friends that know way more about me than a lot of stuff uh, die recently. And, uh, and for Mrs. Mrs. Dargendorp, I got your email. I just haven't had time to reply to you. Uh, my apologies. There's just been a lot going on. But yeah, there's not a day that goes by where I don't think about streaming and then don't feel like it in part because I miss Andy. Okay. $10. $10. Yeah, go ahead. Australian from the unknown HOV. Just quick hi from down under. Love the show. Uh, GFYJ. Um, hey, you want to assume that is go fornicate yourself. Jimmy. Yeah. absolutely Jimmy, yeah so yeah, it, it's gotten to the point and where that back. almost 
it's gotten kind of to the point where that almost feels like an I love you, Jimmy, which I know is going to irritate him. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the interesting thing about language. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I, I can censor myself. I don't, don't always do it. Like I'll drop an F bomb and not just cause I was in the Navy for eight years or because I think words shouldn't have magical powers or any number of things, but I find it childish to substitute frick frack feck for fuck. Um, you're not yeah. fooling another human person. You're not fooling a God. Um, if that's the word now, if you, if you just prefer the other one, like if you're a Battlestar Galactica fan and you just want to say fracking, I'm with you there. But right. when language is our plaything, and it's the concept and the meaning that matters. And so when you, yeah. when you decide to use those substitutionary things like go fuck yourself, Jimmy, eventually they come to mean the thing that you're intending them to mean. Yeah. And I know the algorithm punishes that and it's just a habit of not trying to, uh, for, for on my part, not to do anything to cause the, the algorithm to downgrade the channel any, but I know you use it oh, freely, man. so it probably doesn't matter. I never even thought about the, the, the algorithm down. Wow. All right. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> Fuck the algorithm. Yeah, exactly. Is this me? $10 to Charlie Davis. Why well, get more upset with LGBTQ friendly Christians saying Bible views are better is eerily similar to the type of language my Baptist church used to preach homophobia. So it always scares me a bit. Why well, get more upset with LGBTQ friendly Christians? I don't know if I'm advocating that. Um, saying Bible view, biblical views are better is eerily similar to the type of language my Baptist church used to preach homophobia. So it always scares me a bit. I'm not saying they're better. The gay-friendly churches are better in a moral sense, but they don't have a biblical leg to stand on. If your religion is based on the Bible and you're preaching something that's contrary to the Bible, you are automatically on weaker position. I, I much prefer, I'll hang out with and in a, a gay-friendly Baptist church, uh, no problem at all. But the fact of the matter is, when the Bible says, that if a man lies with another man as he lies with a woman, then they, they've committed an abomination or deserving of death. Um, there's not an interpretation that, that, that can reasonably claim the Bible is gay-friendly. You have to toss that out. And I think there are wonderful people for agreeing to toss it out. I just don't know why they don't go the rest of the steps and toss out the rest of it because they're pointing to the same book. But I, I'm not more upset with them. I just, they have the weaker position they have the more moral position, but they have the theologically weaker position. I hope I hope that cleared up whatever. I know I know I've said that many times, so ten dollars from Eric Mishima, who wants to live forever. Um, I would assume that you're going for the uh the song. Um yeah. but I'm not going to sing for anybody because that would really do bad <laughs> things to the algorithm. Yeah. Yes, we don't want to get demonetized. Jim sings yeah, pretty much. Jim sings perfectly, and he would sound just like Freddie Mercury if he were to sing that. So much so that it would trip the uh, algorithm, and we would get demonetized. That's what I mean. No, I was thinking actually more along the lines of it. The algorithm would assume I'm torturing people and uh, demonetize us for for that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is with people who people named Jim who can't fucking take a compliment, but I'll go with it either way. I can't say. <laughs> $10 from Josh. You've never heard me saying. I don't know any of you and you don't know me, but know how important the company all of you hosts provide and the loneliness that comes from deconstructing. I appreciate this community so much. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, I appreciate the contribution, but I, I really appreciate you, you saying so because for years now, uh, I would say I've done everything I can, but I never feel like I do enough. It doesn't matter how much I do. There's more needs to be done, and I haven't done enough. But I genuinely want to and care about building and promoting community, which is why I spent so much time doing all of this for free in my spare time, um, you know, working with as many organizations as I could. And when I hear from people who are having a difficult time or even just a mildly difficult time who benefit from recoveringfromreligion.org, from American atheists, from 
Freedom for Religion Foundation, from Americans United for Separation of Church and State, from the various shows and programs, from the debates, that makes it worth it. And it is... I used to joke that maybe I was doing penance even though I wasn't Catholic, that I, I w worked to lead... I've definitely led more people away from religion than I ever led to religion uh, or was ever even associated you know, if the Holy Spirit led them through me, I've already beaten that number by lots. Um, right. And I wish I could show you guys some of the emails. Um, unfortunately, I don't have access to some of them anymore, but it's, it's a really, messages like these are incredibly important. So thank you, Josh. People shouldn't feel alone. And I, I would go, yeah, I would go so far as to point out that, uh, Harvard has done an 80 year study on happiness and the number of people uh, in your social secure uh, circle has a direct bearing on, on how happy you are. So please go uh, to meetup.com and find some uh, folks to hang out with. Uh, they don't all have to be atheists. Of course, there's a lot of stuff on there. Go to your local Facebook groups and find uh, some local groups to interact with in person. Uh, nothing yeah. quite beats that still, but uh don't be lonely. Get out there and talk to some people and uh, get some more hobbies and, and fill your time with uh, secular things, uh, which could be bowling or board games or breeding snakes. Um, yeah. Just go out there and, and, and do that. So uh, $10 from Alakazam. Curious to get y'all's thoughts on arrogance and if it's a good or bad thing and how to be less arrogant. Thanks. Um... People call me arrogant. Um, I try not to be. I try to stay humble and realize that, um, you know, I can make mistakes. One of my, my mantras is all hardware sucks, all software sucks, and people make mistakes. I'm a software engineer, so two of those definitely apply to me. And one of those is the excuse I give when my software doesn't work. <laughs> Uh-oh. Jim just froze up. And it coincided with me asking the producer to do something for me. So I hope I didn't just screw that up when we, when we get Jim back. How many times you get back up? Oh, there's Jim back. Oh. You, you froze for a minute. It may have just What's been me, but you may want to restate what you just stated. Oh, I was just going to say for me, just remember that all hardware sucks, all software sucks, and people make mistakes. Um, <laughs> I definitely applied it to two of those. I'm a software engineer. I write my own software. Um, but yeah, just try to remember that you can make mistakes and be humble and be willing to be corrected. Um, confidence is often mistaken for arrogance, and I'm fairly confident in a lot of the things that I have. Sometimes I shouldn't be. Oh, cool. I'll just keep them. If they get away from me, they get away from me, as long as the cat's not in here. Thank you. Uh, 1999 from Nick. It seems a fine-tuning argument depends on the number of attempts at a new universe are being made. If it's 10 to the thousand, then the odds become 100%. How can anyone say it's unlikely without knowing attempts? Um, if they can't. I, well, yeah, I don't know how anybody can, I don't, I don't even know how you could, like you're saying, if it's 10 to the thousand, the, the odds become 100%. I think not knowing how many attempts there were is, is, is partly the point. But we have to be careful that we don't get into the you know, the infinite monkeys thing. Um, I find it funny that in so many of these conversations about theism, when people start talking about what's possible and what's probable, um, to me, probable requires either a calculation, which requires some discrete number, or if you're using a colloquial probable, there needs to be some estimation of a concrete value. Uh, and w we don't tend to get that. We don't tend to get them, you know, they're not showing their work. It's, uh, and most of the time it seems to be a, well, you haven't showed me this is impossible. So I'm going to say that it's possible and then say that it's likely. Uh, and so, yeah. But thanks, Nick. Is Jim back or did he freeze again? He looks frozen. Oh, yeah. I'll do this. 1999 from Jamnik 6. Matt, thank you for sharing that moment of catharsis during the call with Jerry. Both of you shared advice with callers tonight that's also helping me sort out stuff in my own life. Arden, thank you for squashing the troll. Jimmy, go fuck yourself. Thank you, Jamnik. I appreciate that. I'm glad it was uh, it was useful. 
Chris Becca Music, nine ninety nine. It was nice chatting tonight. Thank you for taking my call. No more drugs for me. Well, you know, at least use them responsibly and don't try not to draw conclusions from them uh, that aren't warranted. And a follow up from Jamnik, uh, nine ninety nine. Thank you again. Several silly songs with Larry from Veggie Tales are brilliant. Even though it's for kids, the music's well written. Lyrics usually secular, and some are just funny. Awesome. I I will check it out. Um, for those of you who are wondering why Arden came over here, um, I asked her to bring her over two of our brand new babies that, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. don't tangle yourself up in the mic cord, uh, that hatched this past week and have had their first shed. So now they look as pretty as they will ever look uh, post their first shed. But $10 from Energy Source. What do you think of objections to the Kalam involving all moments in time being equally real, a bouncing cosmos or a larger cosmos multiverse? Theists need to know the alternatives to a creator. That might be the biggest, like that could be an hour lecture even before I go out and do the research on the parts that I don't necessarily know. Uh, but I'll tell you this. I don't think that the standard version of the Kalam has anything that would require uh, that sort of rebuttal. But I certainly think that rebuttals along those lines are useful, especially for the ones that have a better understanding uh, of the Kalam than the average person does. But just like nobody's ever become a Christian because of the transcendental argument for the existence of God, I don't think uh, the sort of people who find the Kalam compelling are going to care much about uh, bouncing universes, multi-universe, et cetera. All right. But here, let me show you. Yeah, the Kalam's kind of a nothing burger. We, this is, if I can get it to show up on screen, a banana uh, black pastel ball python. Gorgeous. I have... Uh, I have two snakes in my hand, and I was going to show them one at a time. But now I'll just show them both side by side. So the lighter colored one is a super banana mahogany. Oh, yeah, you can see the pattern a little bit there. And the darker colored one is a banana black pastel. These are two of the four that just hatched and just had their shed. They do not look as good on camera for whatever reason uh, as they do in person. I took pictures with a better camera. We'll get them up and, and uh, listed. Uh, that's That and the rats are what I spend a good deal of my spare time on. Sorry to anybody who's snake averse. I'm not trying to, to scare you, but these are just, they're not slimy. They're not dangerous. They are friendly and beautiful. And we're going to feed them starting tomorrow. Uh, I just love the fact that we got both a super banana, a regular banana, which you haven't seen in here, uh, or super banana mahogany. And then two, we have two that look of the uh, banana black pastel that you're seeing going through my fingers right now. Um, just wonderful. That's what I've been spending one of my time on um, when I'm not doing shows. And I'm doing more shows every week. There's a lot of content for here on the line for you to check out, um, and especially stuff between now and next week, obviously, you have the Transatlantic Call-In Show starting at 2 p.m. Central tomorrow with Arden Hart and Kara Griffin from Recovering from Religion. This Sunday, will be me and Jimmy uh, on the Sunday show. Monday, Skep Talk is going to be John Gleason. So all of you who had questions about mythicism, that's your prime opportunity to call in and talk to an actual mythicist. But John's great on a number of other things as well. Uh, so you can dig in and ask him questions there. And then Tuesday's Dying Out Loud is going to feature Dave Warnock and my friend and the friend of this show and of this network, uh, Andrew Seidel. So if you had questions to follow up on court cases, um, that is a great opportunity to actually do that. Jim, thank you so much uh, for both agreeing Thanks to delay your, your time on this show a week so we could talk about court cases. Oh, no worries. Uh, but yeah, take, take care of yourself. Pull that uh, mobile home back down to Austin at some point uh, to interact with us down here. And a uh, huge thank yeah. you to our call screeners, our moderators, and to the six, I mean, the most wonderful producer in the world um, who brought me snakes. So 
<laughs> I, I'll be back on Sunday with Jimmy. I'll see the rest of you back here on Wednesday. Take care of yourself. Try to remember that you don't need to hate anybody. And that even if you do, there's a way to try to make sure that you're being as positive about that as possible. And I think when you find that you've made it to the point where you think you hate someone and it's a positive, I think you'll find you don't actually hate them at all. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Look, there's the credits. Oh, I think if they donated enough money, I was supposed to take off my clothes, but I can't take off my clothes while I've got these snakes in my hand.